Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the July 11, 2016 Town Council meeting. We will start, as always, with the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item two on the agenda is public comment, but there's been a suggestion based on the number of uh, people that are signed up already. Um, we usually have five minutes to speak. Uh, is, is there any discussion anybody wants to have about shortening that so that we can get to uh, some of the later items? Um, throwing it out there. Any uh, thoughts on maybe a limitation to three minutes? so that everybody can get heard and we can help cover our business. Yes, Mr. Best. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to keep it to five minutes as, it, as it's posted on the agenda. Anybody else entertaining the Secretary's suggestion? All right. Well, we'll keep it at five minutes and we'll uh, we'll try to get to everything that we can. Uh, Mr. Bass, excuse me, Mr. Bass, Mr. Uh, Mayor, we have a list. I yes, yes, we do have a list. Um, Susan Johnson, please. Thank you, Town Council and Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments about whether or not the Children's Center should stay on the health insurance plan for the town. First and foremost, let me say that I understand the Mayor's concerns. And in the past two weeks, the Children's Center has spoken with a number of experts in the insurance field, because we were concerned, are there risks? For instance, we spoke to Lori Craig, who is the town's representative from Cigna on this plan, on the town's self-insured insurance plan. I quote what Lori said to me. It's not a problem to have non-employees on the town's self-insured plan. The town defines eligibility, not Cigna, not Cigna's documents. Okay. She also said that there's a negligible premium inflation risk if there were a catastrophic illness, if one of the town, the Children's Center employees got seriously sick. She laughed. She said, Susan, you have 11 people out of 800. You are insignificant. That didn't make me feel good. I don't like to be insignificant. But in this case, it's probably right. She also said that the funding rate is set based on all 800 in the plan, and that when they set the funding rate, the top expenses are thrown out. They considered them an aberration and not worthy of consideration. And finally, she said, the risk of a really large claim hurting the town coming through the Children's Center is, not, is negligible because the town has done a really good job of managing that risk. It has a stop loss policy in place per person and per the overall plan that caps the town's expenses. So that was Cigna and my conversation with Cigna. Terry is here today. Terry, where are you? Terry from Siegel. Terry is the insurance broker for the town who worked on this insurance plan for the town. In speaking with Terry, and I will quote you, Terry, you said, many towns have non-employees on their self-insured plans. It is a common and acceptable practice. She said, too, that the risk of a large claim hurting the town is, again, negligible because we're such a small percentage of the insured pool. And finally, she said, that stop-loss policy protects the town, and though she could not recall any actual stop-loss events where it might have been triggered, she said, if, they, if one occurred, it would be excluded when calculating the rate for the next year because it was one of the top ones and would be thrown out. We also spoke with an auditor for Travelers Insurance who works on KERMA. KERMA was raised at the last session saying, we're worried about the town's KERMA risk. KERMA stands for the Connecticut Inter... Where did I put it down? Linda, do you remember? <laughs> Inter ins insurance Policy Management Agency. It, it deals specifically with workers' comp and um, liability. Now, the person we spoke to 
did the Kerma audits for Bethel and for Ridgefield. This is her field. And she said, there's no risk to the town for Kerma at all. You have your own liability policy. You're not employees of the town. It's an arm's length relationship. There's no Kerma risk. So needless to say, we're a little confused. We're getting the message from one side that says there's huge risk, and we're getting another that says there's no what? OK, then I'll take my other spot, too, <laughs> or not. Okay. Actually, I think it's about 350, so you have another minute. OK, so a little history. The Children's Center was approached by the town to be offering low-income families affordable child care back in the 1970s. We didn't ask for this. We were asked to do this. Um, and in doing so, the town said, we will support you. We know it's expensive. But on top of that, the Children's Center then researched and found a huge grant that would actually supply the sliding fee scale funding for the town. Right now, that grant is $325,000 a year. And for 45 years, millions of dollars have come into this town to support the low-income families having childcare so they could work and pay taxes. One of the requirements of that grant, and, and every year we maintain the eligibility for both the town and for the school to keep that grant money flowing into us. And one of the criteria is we have to have and offer health insurance to our employees. And for years we did. Up until 1990, the school had its own health insurance plan. But then it became just cumbersomely, we couldn't afford it. I don't want to be thrown back into that position with the new plans that might be presented tonight. They're not going to solve the problem for this grant coming into the school. Um, so when I think about the insurance, I really want to think it bigger than that. I want to think about the relationship between the town and the school. 45 years of success. 45 years doing what? Together, we have prepared over 3,500 students to be ready to succeed. It's up. Okay, I'm going to quote one last thing from the plan. May I quote the last quote from the uh, action plan from 1970? Tom says yes. Just, yeah, read, read A Guide to Tomorrow was written in 1970 from the town. It said, and its words are relevant today, the key here is the ordinary citizen. The people of the town prepared this plan, and it takes into account the particular needs and resources of their own community. The action plan is the product of the people themselves. If this action plan is to be more than another report gathering dust on the shelf, it will be because of you, our citizens, that you are willing to devote as much time and attention to the needs of others and the problems which indirectly affect the town as a whole. The town's community development action plan began with concerned citizens, and concerned citizens are needed today to assure that the recommendations are thoughtfully considered and implemented with courage and determination. I ask the town council to have the courage and determination to put this action on hold until a comprehensive review is conducted and a decision can be reached that weighs all essential factors. Thank you. Uh, next person. Mr. Mayor, may I ask uh, if my daughter, uh, this is a public hearing for the town in Milford. There are people on the list from Roxbury, Sandy Hook, Lakeville. May I ask a uh, comment from the uh, town attorney? Is this proper protocol? Uh, quickly, I'm looking at our awards and procedure, and we adopted a uh, we adopted back in December. And looking at those quickly, I I'm just looking super quick at the public participation provision. While well, I'm looking, is there any other guidance limitations to? Uh, Town residents of council members know about? Nope. Okay. Yeah, sure. It's uh, rule number six. Is uh, basically the the order of the meeting includes an opportunity for members of the public to address the town council and be speaker given five minutes. So there's no restriction on them being an elector or a resident of the town. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Charles Raymond. 
For the record, I live in Roxbury, but I also happen to be the chairman of the board of the Children's Center. So I thought that got me a toe in the door here. And, and I didn't want the job, but, it, but I'm here. And, uh, you know, it, it turned out to be a very nice organization. Anyway, let me give you a little background. I don't want to rehash too much of what you said, but the town approached the Children's Center. Um, they were a private organization doing what daycare facilities do. The town thought, in their wisdom, that having a facility that would be low income, uh, affordable income for uh, people who could not afford daycare, that we offer that service. We signed on, you signed on, and then we were off. For the next 20 years or so, this, the center, there was contributions from the town, but the center largely existed on the fees from paying full fee people and from grants, and, and they've been very imaginative in getting grants, let me tell you. And over the years, I, I, at a rough guess, I'm saying we probably got at least $8.8 .8 million in grants brought into the town. You never saw it. It's all filtered in through care for these kids and all that. I mean, you do the math. We're getting 350,000 or so a year now. Back in the 70s, it was 160. Do the numbers, and 8.8 and .8 is probably a modest number. Anyway, um, by 1990, the cost of insurance had gotten so prohibitive that it was on the verge of breaking the institution. And at that point, the Board of Selectmen, I guess it was at the time, you weren't called Count Council at that time, um, in their wisdom, they thought it was time to step up and help out, and they did. And we entered into an understanding with the town uh, that we would do our part and keep the affordable care program afloat, and you would help out by giving help on the medical insurance by allowing our people to sign on. Um, we do not get this for free. The town contributes, but we pay 70% of the fee. We're paying $170,000 a year right now for 11 people. It's not everybody on the staff, it's just those 11. And if you do the math and that again, I mean, we're looking at, we, we've contributed about $800,000 to the town, to the general kitty. I, and I don't know what the numbers are as far as our, what we've taken out, but I suspect we're either breaking even or you're making a profit on it. That it, We still haven't seen the numbers there. That's why we're, we're gonna need some time. That's why I say, that's what Susan was saying, give us two months or so, or three months, whatever, to hash it out, find out what the real numbers are. Um, and let's see, and to qualify them for those grants, it isn't simply you just send in a request. The, the requirements are stringent. They require high degrees of education for the staff. We don't pay a hell of a lot of money. The high pay is $17.50 an hour. I mean, where do you get a master's degree person to do that? One of the reasons they do it is because we have a quality medical insurance program that augments their salary. And, and it's not for everybody in the staff, it's just for those 11 or 12 people, whatever it is. Um, we are a full-time daycare facility. We're not two hours a day. We're there all day. And it is a sliding scale. Some of these people pay eight bucks a week. I mean, for those of you who are looking for daycare, I mean, it's, it's a lot more than that. And so, and we do it because we're a nonprofit organization. We are cutting a budget that is so tight, so thin. Um, you know, you talk about a few thousand dollars a month or extra. That's the kind of stuff that breaks an organization like this. So, and, and, and our pr big funding, I mean, we go out, we get money in grants, but we're always out there begging for money, as you probably know. We're always try having fundraisers, and fortunately, there's a lot of people who step up and just outright give us money. Thank heavens, because we could never do the things that we're doing. And, there, and for those of you who have not seen the center, I invite you to come up and take a look around. It's, it's a quality place. Um, anyway. The realities are we provide an essential service for the low income folks in this town, and they are out there. Uh, we bring in a lot of money into the town. It just disappears, doesn't go into the general fund, but it it's, comes in a form of services that we provide. And we pay a substantial part of our medical insurance. It's not a free ride, but now we find there's an attempt to change the rules of the agreement that this, your predecessors, the legacy of this organization, you said you've made it an agreement with us. You asked us to do it, we did it. 
By 1990, we were in trouble financially. You stepped up and you helped us out. And that's helped us keep afloat over these years. And to me, a five minute mark, the wisdom of the predecessors is still in place. An agreement is an agreement. You shook hands. We kept our part of the bargain. Yes. Good evening, Mayor, Town Council. Good evening. Uh, my name is Diane Gallick, and I have been a preschool teacher with the Children's Center for 30 years. That's a long time. The Children's Center has served the New Milford community for over 45 years. The dedicated staff of the Children's Center strive to provide a safe, nurturing, and educationally sound environment for the children three months to eight years of age, and many of the children are here. Parents, many who must work, have peace of mind that their child is being well cared for in their absence. The reality is that the Children's Center has its cost to run as it does. How sad it would be no longer to allow us to be part of the town insurance. The effect will be felt not only by the staff, but by the families who depend on us and are already feeling the strains of the economy. I'm sure the council members who have children or our grandparents feel as we do at the center, having a great place to raise our families when, family, when families are working parents, single moms, single dads, have a place that's safe, nurturing environment to leave their children. As a staff member of the Children's Center, I am asking you that the council members please reconsider that the Children's Center health insurance not be canceled so that the Children's Center can continue to serve the community and future children for years to come. Thank you very much. Susan Campbell. Good evening, all. Good evening. This isn't as easy as it looks. <laughs> I live here in New Milford as well, in Sunny Valley. My name is Susan Campbell. I live at 38 Sunny Valley Road here in New Milford. To say the Children's Center means something to me is an understatement. I know it very intimately. I've known thousands of children and families. Each and every one of them served the highest quality early childhood education experience that set the foundation for their future endeavors and their very lives. Children of past mayors have come through our doors, state representatives, town officials, town directors, town attorneys, police officers, public school teachers. Children of all types of town hall personnel have come through our doors. And we continue to serve our town employees because we are part of this town. We are a golden thread woven into the tapestry of this town, and we matter. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't even start there. For the past 45 years, the Children's Center has served another population, the low to moderate income family, the working poor. Without the center, these families would not be able to afford a high quality early childhood education experience for their children. We've all been very fortunate. We've always had a town that supports what we do, that believes in our mission statement. The Children's Center of New Milford is dedicated to providing quality, developmentally appropriate early care and education to the children of our community, regardless of background or ability to pay. Yes, the children look upon the Children's Center, that Tudor-style building up the hill from the green, and they call it the castle. I've dwelled within its walls for these many, many years and think of it as nothing less than one of the jewels in the crown of this town. The Children's Center needs you now, more than ever. 
Our hardworking, dedicated, highly educated staff work for me meager wages, and yet they possess college degrees and years of experience. The health care benefit through the town has been a consistent, reliable, and highly valued benefit for the past 26 years. No doubt because our partnership has been long and the reciprocity has been strong. Our health care benefit through the town has also literally been a lifesaver because for me, it was. Ten years ago, I had a less than 20% chance of surviving a life-threatening illness. But I was lucky. I had good insurance and I was able to return to good health. This Thursday, I have the honor and the privilege of celebrating my 30th year with the Children's Center of New Milford. You can tell she writes our annual letter. Can you tell the way she writes? <laughs> <laughs> I am Linda Gomez, and I live in Lakeville. I am the comptroller at the Children's Center. Okay. I've seen, every year I come up here with Susan, uh, January time, and talk to all of you about our wonderful Children's Center. Um, I've been there almost 20 years, actually, come November, and we've all, there's a lot of us that have a lot of age uh, at the Children's Center. I won't talk long. Um, I just want to, Susan asked me to come up and say a few things. And the biggest thing, I, I'm being there as long as I have. Things have changed a lot in the Children's Center. Um, the state funding has changed a lot. You would have saw me every single week because years ago, when I first started the Children's Center, the mayor had to sign the checks. Not only, you know, one of our directors, but also a mayor. In the bank, the money only could go into Connecticut National Bank account. It couldn't go into any other account. So the state has changed a lot of paperwork and everything else. They got you off the hook. You no longer have to come down here. We send you the reports, but you don't have to sign the checks anymore. Now we do a single audit. We always had an audit, but now we have the single audit, which you here have in the town. So we no longer have to come down and visit as much. You can still come visit us, though. We'd be glad to have you. Um, but the reason I started at the Children's Center as a comptroller is I was a parent. I was a single parent. I came. Moved back here to New Milford after my divorce, stayed with my dad and stuff, and met this wonderful person, Sue Campbell. Someone said, call the con, because I had to go back to work full time. I was a stay-at-home mom. So I went back to work. My children went to the Children's Center. It was the best experience I ever had. So about five years later, Susie calls me and says, we have a problem. We lost, we lost our bookkeeper. We have no one to do our state reports. And back then, like I said, they were quite extensive. She says, can you help me? I was there the next day. I couldn't help. How can you not help them? They've done so much for me. They put me back on my feet. My daughters are now, one lives in Colorado, counting, does the same thing, loves it. I have another one going back to school to be a teacher. Same thing. I mean, they've succeeded so far, and their start was here. So, and I, I credit these teachers. They were phenomenal. They, they treat them like their own. But, so I won't take much of your time, but if anybody has any questions on financials or anything else, I'm the person to call. So I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. How are you doing? I want to thank the council and the mayor for letting me speak. I'll be brief. Uh, my name is John Deanna, 44 Housatonic Avenue in Milford. The Children's Center is not just a daycare school with a curriculum. Some of the things they do in the school, such as lessons at Studio D, which is in New Milford, pottery classes at the VCA. Um, they do they get Spanish lessons. They get yoga classes, music through movement, class, uh, classes through literacy and, lyric, uh, literacy and lyrics, and just a few examples. Other things that the Children's Center does for the community provides in my opinion, an integral part of the fabric of this community. They have a program called BASH. Children collect money for the Christmas tree lights, the replacement. They go through, they do Christmas carols at all the local places, the town hall here, the senior center, the library, the post office. It's an important thing that these people do. 
And on a personal note, we had a family emergency. I needed some place to bring my son. Without any question, they took him. We lost a family member that day. They sent me home with a meal for my son. So that way we could, we could be looked after. That's the kind of people that these people are. They're not just a, it's not just a, I'm getting a little worked up here. They're not employees, they're friends, they're teachers, they're valued members of this community. I really urge them at the council to really, really, really think about what the actions and the impact it has, not just on the people, but all the people that bring their children there. And, well, you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. Thank you very much. Hello. Some of you will recognize me. My name is Mary Burnham. I live at 24 Walnut Tree Hill Road, Sandy Hook. I was the past director of the Children's Center. Um, I see a few familiar faces. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, I wanted to give you a little history, because I came to the center in 1991, February 4th to be exact. My first board meeting with the board of directors, <clears throat> Susan's mother was the first director, and she was there with me. I was shocked because the chairman, or chairwoman, I don't actually remember, of both the Democratic Town Committee and the Republican Town Committee sat on the board of directors of the Children's Center. The reason I was surprised is because politics wasn't involved. They were concerned about the people of New Milford, the families of New Milford. And one of the things they wanted to make sure was that people who were needed assistance could work, could work full time, could keep families together, to keep income coming, keeping people off welfare rolls. This was all the most important things to this board. In addition to that, not only does, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't even understand this discussion. The center is, should be a vital part of your economic worries. They not only bring people and employ people themselves, but they keep 47 families employed. That not, that, I mean, in the state of Connecticut, we need those families to stay employed. I do some work up in Hartford at times. The, so I, I, it, when Susan told me that there was a possibility that the center was going to be separated, in a sense, from the town, I was shocked. I, I don't understand how and why you wouldn't want to support these families, support your town. To me, it makes New Milford different, it makes you special, and it keeps families in town and keeps your incomes and the state incomes, it, it's vital. In addition to that, because of the quality, you're also, in a sense, saving money because you have a whole bunch of kids going from a quality preschool into the public schools, which, if you look at all the studies, are going to prevent kids and they're going to help kids and have them actually be ready for kindergarten. So, and, and then you less in special ed, all kinds of wonderful things. So to me, this is a mystery. And if somebody would like to explain why you would want to do this separation, I'd, I'd appreciate a, a, an understanding. Because when I started at the center, I was there over about 20 years. It, I came to the town, I mean, Linda's talking, it was actually me who she <laughs> interacted with at first instead of Susan. But at any rate, it, we, we, we were always, a, every year I'd come before the town council and we were welcomed with open arms. They couldn't be prouder or more excited to support the center because of the wonderful work that we did. So. If you have any questions about history from the 90s to when Susan took over, I'd be more than happy <laughs> to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bolero will be uh, giving an update later on on the, uh, on the issue. Uh, Mr. Bennett. 
Good evening. I'm Lori Putnam. I live at 5 Hilltop View Road in New Milford. My daughter, Jennifer Burns, is a teacher at the Children's Center, has been a teacher for five years. She could not be here tonight, so she asked me to read two notes that she and her fellow nursery school teachers received at the end of this school year. It is with heartfelt gratitude that I write this at a very bittersweet milestone point in Silas's life. In two years, in your expert and nurturing care, a nervous, shy little boy has blossomed. As an educator myself, I have watched with admiration as you provided age-appropriate lessons, season with love, and life's interactions. He loves school and has learned so much beyond paper and pencil activities. He has made friends, learned manners in a setting other than home, and has learned to respect and trust other adult authority figures. Most of all, Silence is comfortable and knows that he's special and has a voice. This is bittersweet because Silas is so content and secure in his little learning cocoon, but must move on. He doesn't understand this part, but I know that you have provided him with the confidence and skills to enter a larger learning experience. He speaks of all of you and his classmates very fondly, and it is sad that his time at the Children's Center is coming to an end. I look forward to Ari's time with you. As you know, he's already raring to go. Thank you for all that you do for children each day. You teach and give with heart and soul. This note was addressed to all three of the nursery school teachers. This note was addressed to my daughter. Happy summer. It's scary to think about how fast these two years have gone by. We just want to thank you for being such an important part of Silas's life. He's gone from being the boy who was terrified about heading to school to being the boy who can't wait to go back. That's thanks to you. Whenever something exciting, interesting, or big happened, Silas wanted to know when he'd be able to go back to school to tell you all about it. He adores you. You made him feel comfortable and confident. We couldn't have asked for more in his preschool years. You'll always be extremely special to us. We hope Ari is just as lucky to call you his teacher when it's his turn. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Kim Oshman. I live at 690 Kent Road in Gaylordsville. Um, I'm a New Milford resident. I grew up here. I attended the Children's Center back in the 70s. I was one of the first classes that Barbara Hamlin, um, under the direction of Barbara Hamlin, Susan's mom. Um, I moved back to New Milford three years ago with my two boys. I have a 17-year-old son and a three-year-old, and had a three-year-old son, Sam. And I needed childcare, a safe, reliable childcare. Um, I was working a lot of low-paying jobs, and I couldn't pay a lot of money. Um, all it took was one phone call to Susan, and I had one less thing to worry about. I want to read a letter that my son wrote, Thomas. He's 17. He's very smart. He's uh, an honor student. He's president of the German Honor Society, president of the debate team, and a much better activist and writer than I am. And he wrote this letter. He can't be here tonight. Um, he said, Dear Mayor Gombach, my name is Thomas Lieber, and I'm a high school student attending New Milford High School. I'm 17 years old, and I have a brother, Sam, who is six. My family, consisting of my mother, Sam, and I moved to New Milford three years ago, and when Sam was three. Since moving here, he has gone to the Children's Center for daycare and preschool. Today, Sam attends the Children's Center after school and during the summer. In our first year of living here in New Milford, my mother, single at the time, fluctuated between joblessness and a small number of low-paying jobs and was only barely able to provide for our family. We received help from a number of charitable people and organizations around town, but one of the most helpful was the Children's Center. My mother, being very open with me about our situation, informed me that payment to the Children's Center scaled based upon income. My family's income being low, payment for Sam's daycare and preschool was minimal. The ability of the Children's Center to provide my little brother with daycare at a low rate was the only thing allowing my mother to go to work and be able to pay for rent and groceries. Not only was preschool helpful in terms of money, but they truly made us feel like family. 
My brother Sam began to make wonderful friends, and my mother formed a relationship with a number of the teachers. The education Sam received was phenomenal. He was beginning to read and write and understand basic mathematics. He still goes there and recently brought home a very good report card. I credit the Children's Center with advancing his education. This is just an excerpt of my family's story from the last three years. My main reason for relaying it to you is because I believe the Children's Center is a place deserving of much praise and thanks. I cannot describe with words how helpful the people working there have been. Today I found out through a family friend that you are planning on cutting the employees of the Children's Center off the town's health insurance. You should not be surprised that I was shocked and disheartened to hear the news. After health insurance provided by the town is cut out, the Children's Center will only have three options. Force employees to buy their own, provide health care for the teachers, or shut down. Knowing one of the teachers from the Children's Center, I can tell, I can with absolute confidence tell you that these are not wealthy people. Therefore, without a pay increase, I believe these employees would not be able to afford good health care on their own. Raising wages would lead to raising payment costs for the Children's Center. Were this to happen, it's possible that parents like my mother would not be able to afford the costs and would have no place for their child to go during the day. The second option, providing health care, would also lead to an increase in cost to families. These two options are simply out of the question because they would leave some parents with no place for their child to be cared for where they work to bring home much needed money. The third and final option is to close down. Again, this leaves children without a place to stay and be cared for during the day. The action of cutting off, of, off teachers at the Children's Center from the town's health insurance will directly lead to children missing out on needed education and care. It will lead to families being stressed further than they are now due to lack of affordable care for their children. I ask you to reconsider your position because these are families like mine that need the Children's Center. It's been a blessing to my family and especially to my little brother and to cut out health insurance from employees would mean cutting out care and education for a number of New Milford's children. I truly hope you think about this issue, that this is the utmost importance to my family and other low-income families in the area. Thank you for your time and consideration. Sincerely, Thomas Sleeper. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Walter. Michael Barnes, 17 Sullivan Farm. Uh, I feel a little out of place this evening because my comment is clerical in nature. I was reading, <laughs> I was reading last meeting's minutes, and my comments were very long in that in that meeting, but they weren't accurately recorded, and there were things that were attributed to me that I did not say. So I'd appreciate it if they'd be corrected. Uh, I understand an audio is available. If someone needs a hard copy, I'll be happy to provide it because I simply read from a statement. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Good evening, everybody. I'm Jeff Sankowitz, um, 68 Marwick Manor. Well, I just wanted to remind you that the decision to put the Children's Center employees on as members of the town's group in medical insurance program was a decision by the council, essentially, not the mayor. And I think the mayor, um, as I said last time, if, if you're going to change the policy, uh, you know, you change the policy, maybe you have good reasons to do so. Uh, but I think it was your policy decision to add them to your policy, to your group health care policy, and it should be your decision to take them off. Second of all, at the last meeting, there, was, um, there were several comments made to the effect that having the Children's Center employees as members of your group health insurance program will create a liability issue for the town of New Milford. In other words, if the Children's Center employee uh, has a car accident, taking, you know, picking up a child or taking a child down the green, that the town is going to get sued uh, as, as the employer for potential damages in that car accident. I'll tell you, as a lawyer with 43 years of litigation experience, that, that the risk of that is virtually nil. Uh, having somebody on your group health care program does not result in civil liability to you for the conduct of the employees uh, unrelated to health care, un unrelated to their health care needs. 
it's true, we have several lawyers here, it's true that any lawyer can sue you because it doesn't like the color of your eyes and bring a lawsuit. But the risk to you is so small as to be non-existent. Um, you have more risk from, maybe, I don't know if you have a defibrillator in the, in the town hall, but you have probably more risk from having the defibrillator here and preventing somebody from having a heart attack than you would from having these people on your health insurance program. I also speak, I think, for the cemetery workers. I guess there's a couple of those who, um, who are, have been left out of this dialogue. There's nothing that's been said, that, or at least that I've said, that's any different for them. The town, at some point, for whatever reason, made a decision to add them to your health insurance program. You know, that is not unusual. Uh, for me, when I, for years, I was on the CBIA health insurance program. In other words, my little office wasn't big enough to have a group, so I joined a bigger group. So we were able to get insurance, and I was able to provide it for my employees at a, at a better rate than I would have been able to provide it if I was just paying for it myself, because it was basically individual <coughs> coverage, and uh, maybe if they were all 22 years old, it wouldn't have been so bad, but they weren't quite that young. Um, so I think it's a, a decision, a policy decision. I don't think the decision has harmed the town in any way, shape, or form. And if it's cost some money, I think it was worth it. And I think you should keep them on. And um, I, you know, I don't have any connection to the Children's Center anymore. I used to be a member of the board years and years ago, probably in the 90s. But at this point, my only connection to them is that once a year they put the arm on me for a donation. <laughs> And I, uh, and I, and because of and because of my experience with them, my knowledge of them, my knowledge of the town's support for them, I'm willing to support them. You know, if the town says, and I'm not saying you're going to say this, you're going to maybe say it for insurance, but I don't think you'll say it overall, or maybe you'll make it up in a, with a bigger donation or a, big, a bigger uh, contribution. But you know, if the town doesn't support them, why should I? I work hard for my money. There's other charities that are equally deserving. You know, so, so it's a, it's a two-edged sword for you, for the mayor, for the uh, human resources director. Um, but don't get blinded by the idea that because they're on your policy, healthcare policy, that that's a liability issue for the town. That is so remote as to be non-existent, I think, Council will agree with that. Uh, we've been on cases where the towns have been sued for, for virtually nothing. We're on one now. But you know, in the normal world, that's not the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kimberly, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kimberly LaPagna. I live at 9 Quail Ridge Road in Gaylordsville. My daughter recently graduated from the pre-K program at the Children's Center. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I feel as far as any change made within the Children's Center is going to have a negative effect, not only to the children, but to the families and the community. Uh, I ask that you reconsider the uh, employee insurance issue. Thank you. Donna Hello, my name is Donna Dennison. I live at 100 Boardman Road in New Milford, Connecticut. Um, and I just want to talk to you this afternoon. Um, my husband and I are both um, combat veterans. And after my husband's third tour on a combat deployment, we decided that it was time for him to get out. I was already out and moved to Connecticut. Um, after looking at several daycares, we determined we couldn't afford to move here because the cost of childcare was just astronomical. We found the Children's Center, and they had a waiting list at, the t at a time, and when they found out we were combat veterans, both disabled veterans, they helped us out and got us in. Um, with the sliding fee scale, we were able to move here, and my husband and I are both full-time students, and we're able to now support our family and our daughters getting a quality education. She's still there in the Bash K program. Um, we, when we first moved here, our home that we had moved in that was all set up and ready to go ended up having black mold and we all got very sick. 
Um, we had to move out. We have two pit bulls. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to get a hotel room with two pit bulls. It is not easy. Um, the Children's Center stepped in, got us a room that we were in for actually a month. Um, my children started to get sick and getting stomach aches because of the eating the fast food and eating out and not getting home-cooked meals. Again, the Children's Center stepped in and made us home-cooked meals and sent home meals with my daughter so that my kids were no longer getting sick. Um, we found a place to live in the process of moving. They kept our kids. If we were late a couple times, it wasn't a big deal. They did everything in their power to support our family and to show their support for combat wounded veterans who have come to a new community with no family. We're, I'm from Colorado, my husband's from Texas. Um, we came here on a fluke, on a whim, and because of the Children's Center, our commitment and our dedication to this community has grown more than it ever has in any community. They introduced us to the Village Center for the Arts, which me, my husband, and my children all volunteer at. We volunteer at the school. We have now become integral parts of this community and have truly grown in this community, and none of it would have happened without the VCA. That's my story. As you guys can tell, obviously, this is a place that is loved. You have a standing room only packed house here because this place matters. And I beg you, please consider every option you can and look at the entire picture before making a judgment. Because if anybody deserves your consideration, it's definitely the Children's Center. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, I bumped you to the bottom because she signed up twice. <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> okay, I have a little demonstration. Five this, minutes, Susan. I got five minutes. <laughs> Anybody that wants to be in the business of child care has to be registered and licensed with the Department of Public Health. These are the statutes we have to live up to. However, to get the grant that we got, the 325000 that's coming in, the millions that have come in year after year, we have to be nationally accredited. These are the standards for relationships, curriculum, the teaching standards, assessment standards, health standards, what the teacher requirements and credentials are, the community relationship standards, the physical environment standards, oh, my favorite, leadership and management standards, and there's more. Can I stop? To get this grant is no easy, no easy task. It is really hard to do. And when I think about what this town has done, where's my quote, <laughs> over the last 45 years. It's not the Children's Center that's done it. It's us. The town council and we have done it. What have we done? The most important thing, I think, is that we have created a school that represents the community. Our school does not segregate the low income. Half of our people pay full, half are on sliding fee. Our people does not denigrate the poor and isolate them away. This is truly the community at work. This is the working parents that come and pay their tuition, whatever the amount is, and go back to work and pay their taxes. So I can't find my quotes, but I don't think I should take any more time. I just think that the issue isn't about money, because I don't believe the numbers. I've looked at the numbers. I don't think we have the numbers right. I don't believe it's a legal issue whatsoever, and Terry can speak to that later, because Cigna tells me the town defines eligibility, not Cigna. So I don't believe it's legal. I don't believe it's financial. Policy, maybe. There could be some issues about policy, but we've been with the school, I mean, with the town for years, and maybe it's been a policy that's been successful. Do we want to rock that boat now? I don't know. I don't think it would close us out. And I do not believe that there is another insurance out option out there. If we go on the health exchange, you're putting us back to where we were before in 1990 when we couldn't afford child care insur insurance or the insurance for the school. Because everybody knows what's going on in that health care exchange. You have no control over the premium rates. They spike up like crazy. Someone was telling me their rates went up 38% last year on their private plan, and he's actually in a CBIA plan. So the issue is, 
How do we maintain the stability that this school has had for the community for 45 years? The program has worked. I do not believe there's a liability. I do not believe there's a risk. And I do not believe there's a cost, but I sure would like to know for sure. I think it's great that we're looking at it really deeply. I'd like to understand it completely. I know Greg doesn't have the numbers right. I know he doesn't have the facts right. I know he's learning. I know you're new to the job. No blame. I'm glad we have the chance to look at this and really figure it out as to whether it's right and should continue or not. I believe it's right and should continue. And I thank you for your help. It's been a great 45 years. There were some statements here that I did not make. The first statement within the... Which page? I'm looking for them right now. I've read them online. I apologize. I'm looking for them right now. I'm looking, sir. I'm looking. It was in the ones that I read that were sent to me. Page three. I know, I know Michael's on here, but I also have a, a comment that I apologize. I, I saw when I when it was sent to me via email, but there's a statement in here that I did not make. Can we just have these, the, the, the uh, can we have the tape? I made that one for sure. There's another one in here that I did not make. I apologize. I cannot see it at the moment. It was in the it was in the emailed one. It's not in this one. I think you did. Yeah, you made it. I think one of the statements you made early on. It there, looks like there's a correction. Yeah, now it's, it's it's not not in here. I apologize. I read it online and I did not review this when it first came out. Well, we have to identify it. For right. The tables. So. No, I think I, what I think she did was I think she changed the the person who made the statement. Okay. Yeah, can we table this for just for anybody? Thank you. Sorry about that. But there was a revision. Yeah, it looks like there was a revision. I just did not see that. Okay, fair enough. So we'll table the approval of the minutes. Moving on to item four to the mayor's comments. And I do have a couple of comments. First of all, I do want to thank um, Ms. Uh, Furlow for her years of service. You'll see in your packets that she has uh, submitted her uh, resignation as secretary unrelated to Mr. Esposito's changes, I would assume. <laughs> but she's done, um, you can see that she's pursuing a career in nursing and the timing commitment, which I'm, I'm well aware of is significant, so uh, um, we thank her for her service, and uh, we'll be interviewing and, and talking to other, you know, recording secretaries from other boards, and we'll get somebody in here to try to fill your shoes, so thank you so much. Make a suggestion to that uh, the console through the mayor's office. Sent a letter of appreciation, 20 years. Absolutely. And a certificate, please. Here, here, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely. I'll still be here next meeting. We'll get you, we'll, we'll take care of it. Yeah, I'm going to still going to at least be for your last meeting school, for school, so. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I will address some of the people that spoke in the crowd and some of the issues that were raised. And, and Mr. Bolero will be making an update later on. But generally speaking, I do want to emphasize, number one, that there's no judgment, there's, there's no value determination made on the Children's Center or, or what they do. There's no doubt that they're valuable to the community and, and what we're doing here, and I think there's a, a misconception, although we've been communicating with Ms. Johnson, that what we're proposing 
is a is a solution. It's it's not something that we're looking to put the Children's Center out of business on. Um, we do support them with seventy-eight thousand five hundred dollars in a check every year. That's taxpayer money. Um, that does go to support them. Um, and the scale is is not going to be affected. The scale that is offered to children, the sliding scale is not affected. You're going to hear Mr. Bolero speak uh, later on. They pay $170,000 a year in health insurance now to the town. We want to pay, let them pay that to their own provider and have control over it. And for that amount, they will get health insurance for their teachers, for their employees. That's what we're proposing. And the reason why we're proposing it is because there are some very finite and definite legal issues. We signed a contract with Cigna, and regardless of what Ms. Johnson has said, Mr. Bolero's had numerous conversations, and that contract limits our insurance to employees. Simple, there's no judgment call, there's no gray area there. Um, there's no doubt that the Children's Center is certainly worthy, um, but I guarantee you that I could have something offered up here and, and Meals on Wheels would come up and say, you know, our organization is funded through the town, and it's so important because we feed people, senior citizens that can't get out of their homes, some so emaciated that without our Meals on Wheels program, these people would probably die. And we're a lifeline to them. And that would be an amazing story, but we don't provide them with health insurance either. The same could go for Visiting Nurses Association. We funnel grant money through the town to visiting nurses, and they could get up here and say, how we go into people's homes and after these catastrophic accidents, we help them get better. We help them get back on their feet. And there's no doubt that that would be worthy of our support. But we don't, because it's not a value judgment that we're discussing here. The same would go for the Head Start program that supports um, and provides not only daycare, but nutritional services for um, low-income families here in New Milford. They do an amazing job. We don't provide them with health insurance, although they receive funding through the state and through the town. Our volunteer fire departments, they're volunteers. We don't provide health insurance to the men and women that rush into fires while our houses are burning. Although we could make a value judgment that they should receive that. But this isn't about value judgments. It's not about what they do. It's about our contracts and it's about the law. Volunteer Ambulance and um, Village Center for the Arts, the same arguments. So we have Mr. Bolero, he will be making an update to show what the effects of what we're proposing will be on the Children's Center and they are effectively zero. For that 170,000 you will get your own health insurance plan and this is different from 1990 and a reasonable plan. Um, and that's what this conversation is about. We're not putting them out of business, we're not cutting our support, they're still gonna receive that $78,500 every year. And they're still gonna receive that $325,000 or $350,000 from the state every year. But this is a true partnership with them that frankly, we just can't look the other way when these issues are raised and they are important legal issues. Um, so that's, that's my comment on that. Mr. Bolero will go into much more detail, but generally speaking, that's what will be discussed. And, and that's our philosophy with regard to this, not to punish anybody or to cut anybody, but to find a reasonable solution that conforms with the law, the contracts that we sign, uh, and good policy. So that's what it boils down to. That's, those are my comments on that. Item five on the agenda are appointments and reappointments to boards and commissions. I move the appointment um, to the Economic Development Commission of David O. Elmar, affiliated for 7 11 2016 to 6 30 2018. Is there a second? Up, oh, second. Okay, any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion and carries. Move the appointment to the Commission on Aging of Patricia E. Hammer, Republican, 7 11 2016 to 11 30 2017. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And move the appointment to the Planning Commission of Joseph W. Girardeau, um, Republican, 7 11 2016 to 11 30 2017, and Gerald J. Monahan, Democrat, alternate, 
7 11 2017 to 11 30 2017. Okay. Any discussion? Any discussion? Yes. Uh, should uh, Monument's term say 7 11 2016? Uh, it should. Yes. Thank you for that scrivener's error. Okay, Drew, then. Thank you. I know it needs to be this With that modification, um, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And move the appointment of the New Milford Aquifer Protection Agency, Joseph W. Girardeau, Republican, 7 11 2016 to 11 30 2017. And Gerald J. Monahan, Democrat, alternate 7 11 2016 to 11 30 2017. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. I move the appointment of um, Andrew B. Grossman, Democrat, to the Historic Properties Commission 7 11 2016 to 11 30 2020. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, moving on to item six is the town council item. Uh, and this is regarding a, a um, change of date from the new, from the town council date of August 8, 2016 to August 22nd, 2016. I'll entertain a motion. Thank you, Mr. Bass. Second. Okay. Any discussion? There are issues with, with uh, obtaining a quorum. Um, seems like a better date for everybody. So. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, item 7, Nicholas Tobin and Associates, a taste of the Milford. Okay, move the um, closure of the Southern Crossover Street on the town of Green, September 7, 2016, from 3 p.m. until 7.30 <coughs> p.m. for the Chase of the Milford event. Second. Okay, we do, have dis we do have discussion. Mr. Kilberg, thank you. Yep, just thank you very much. Jeff Kilberg, uh, Nicholas Tobin, home address is 12 Spruce Lane, New Milford. First of all, it's great to have a crowd, so I get to talk to everybody about A Very Taste fun. of New Milford, which will be September 7th, that's a Wednesday, from 5 to 7.30. Uh, we're looking to close the Southern Crossover Street, and uh, where we're going to have tents and activities connecting the Middle Green with the Southern Green, where there will be a band and other activities. Um, we have about 30 to 35 restaurants, hopefully, this year, and there will be breweries and vineyards at 19 Main Street. Excellent. So. That's, that's a great expansion. Yes, sir. Is it 5 o'clock? It says here at 3 o'clock. Oh, oh, yeah, we're looking to close the, uh, sorry, the crossover street at 3 o'clock to set up. Yeah. Okay. Great sound. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Kilbert. Wait, that's it? <laughs> yeah. All right, <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> first year bubble. Two bucks off the morning. Thank you. Uh, item 8 on the agenda, Commission on the Arts. Okay, move that the uh, closure begin at noon um, and continue through the completion of the concert. This is for the um, 2016 Edwin Kincaid Concerts on the Green and Artist Walk 2016. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Item 9 on the agenda is our update by Personal Director Mr. Bolero. I'll invite him up. Everybody. Okay, so it's been a couple of weeks between. Um, so I listened to everything that the council had to say, you know, two weeks ago, and Tom, um, you know, you wanted to put the ball in my court. I've been. Greg, can you speak up, please? Of course, sorry. Um, so I have been in touch with both Cigna, um, Mary Jane. I was also in touch with Karma. I wasn't able to get Karma here tonight, but um, we do have Terry DeMatty here to go over what some of the plans will be. Um, I've got a bunch of information for you that I just want to share. So quickly, the first thing that I want to share with you is just. A letter from Lori Craig from Cigna. That just defines who our insurance is designed for. And then a letter from Jim Papayashi, who handles the relationship between the town of New Milford and Kerma. And then lastly, just the general you know, terms and conditions of liability from PERMA directly, so you can see where you know, the type 
come to that. But what I came here tonight to do, I don't want to focus on eligibility. I don't want to focus on, you know, what we're doing to remove the Children's Center, but rather, Tom, you wanted to hear about what solutions we had. So I put a lot of work into finding good solutions. So I would just want to talk to you about those, and I'm going to give you each a package for what those solutions are. And there's, there's a number. You know, I've actually identified plans that are very, very similar to the plan that they're on today at a little bit of a lesser cost. Of course. That's from her. So in the thicker package where I want to kind of put our attention to are the different plans. I'll start with this platinum plan that is on top. The platinum plan is very similar to the plan that the Children's Center has today in terms of coverage. There is not an exact plan. This plan is actually offered through Anthem and not from Cigna. But you'll see it has been designed exactly for who is on the Children's Center insurance today. So the quote is actual for what their, their situation is today. And it's accurate as of today's date. So if you flip to the third page, you're going to see that there's two different plans that they could select from. The Anthem Platinum Standard Pathway XPPO, that's at a cost of $18,061.72 per month, which is actually $400 cheaper than what their plan through the town costs today. So with this plan, I'll have Terry DeMatty come up and explain kind of the differences between the plans, but it's very, very similar. It's not a high deductible self savings plan. There's also an, a plan that's offered through United Healthcare. That, in my opinion, it's a, an additional thousand dollars. I wouldn't recommend it, but it is an option that's available to them. Not being an employee of the Children's Center, I really don't have any say as to what they're going to sign up for. But I just want to show there are plenty of options for health insurance out there today that, from a cost perspective, will be affordable to them that can provide very good health insurance. The second package that I want to draw your attention to is the gold. This gold package, the first page actually shows it's got the employees that are enrolled in the plan. This actually gets closer to what they've been paying to the town. They've been on a 70-30 split, which I've done a ton of research. I don't know how it ever got to a 70-30 split. Back in 1990 when they were brought onto the plan, they were brought onto the plan to be employee plus one or employee only, no families, and they were supposed to be paying 100% of the cost to the town. So at that 70%, there's a big difference there. But that being said, this plant, the Anthem Gold Pathway HMO Plus at $15,237.09 is only $90 more expensive than what they were paying with their contribution of the 70% last year. So that would be the full cost of what the plan is and becomes a very, very viable with a good health insurance plan so to them. $90 for, what for, per month. Thank you. Per month. Okay. Um, there are four or three other. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Of, of course. When you say that it's, I, I realize it's only ninety dollars more, but mm -hmm. is there no change to coverage at all? The, there's always going to be change. Anytime you change a health insurance well, plan, there's so change it's, it's to coverage. It's ninety dollars more, but not necessarily more in coverage. I'll but have plus. I'll have Terry come up and describe okay. the what oh, the okay. actual differences Thank are Thank because. You. What you'll actually see, there could be deductibles that would actually change. You might see prescriptions plans that could actually change or what the out-of-pocket expenses could be. Okay. So with this, the most similar plan to what they actually have today would be at a cost of $16,699.30. And that's the total cost of what the plan would be. Similar in terms of what they're receiving? Similar in terms of what they're receiving. From, from coverage perspective, correct. And then lastly, is the silver. So as you go down in your tiers, your coverage amounts don't necessarily go down, but the cost out of pocket will end up going up. I've identified one plan in here that I think could financially make sense for the Children's Center. Um, but again, not being an employee, I, it's hard for me to say what makes sense and, and what doesn't, because I'm not working directly with the leadership or with the employees. But I've identified the Anthem Silver Standard Pathway PPO which is at a cost of $13,874.28 per month to cover all of their employees. 
this plan is not a high deductible health savings plan. It does have a high deductible only if there are some, if someone who is hospitalized or has an ambulatory surgical center expense. It is otherwise on a copayment similar to what they have today. The copayments are slightly higher, but they are not catastrophic by it any sense. So at this point, I'd like to, to invite Terry up and have her just describe the differences between the plans. Mr. Bell, one thing before yeah, you please. invite her up, what do our teachers get right now? So our teachers today are on a high deductible health savings plan that the town actually will contribute to. Their plan has a $2,000 deductible for individuals or $4,000 deductible for families. So our teachers that are with the town today must pay if they have a family coverage. It's gonna be $4,000 out of pocket before any of their insurance actually kicks in. It's a single is 2,000. Do you know how much those teachers make compared to these teachers that at most make $17.66 per hour? It varies, but I don't know offhand. The LMA would be able to do it, so. Almost done. Okay. The other Actually, question was, there's a discrepancy in your numbers. You had said the first plan, which was $18,061, was 400 cheaper per month than what the total cost is of the plan right now, which would mean if there's a 70-30 split, they're paying somewhere around high 12000 They're actually paying 13000 and I can get you the exact number. I wasn't speaking, I was talking about the total cost of the plan, not what they were paying. So that was the difference. The total cost of their plan is 18000 and I want to say it's... Four, and I have to get the actual number. It's eighteen thousand four hundred and sixty ninety three. That's what their plan costs today. And they pay seventy percent. They pay seventy percent. So they are actually paying through June. They paid thirteen thousand four sixty one sixty six last month. Only seventy percent of the twelve thousand six hundred. Of the eighteen four sixty, yeah. I would have to run through the numbers. These are the numbers I got from our finance department. So. Yeah, it would be. Okay. So it's lower than what they're paying. So I'd like so, to know what well, that is Barbara Hamlin also has a supplemental health insurance that is actually being compensated in, in this plan as well. Okay, so can we get a, can we get these discrepancies figured out? Of course. And then you had said that the $15,237 plan is only $90 more a month. And you just said they pay somewhere around 13 dollars No, last year when they had families on the plan, there were several families that fell off. They were actually paying $15,211.28. Okay. What are they paying this year? This year they're paying thirteen thousand four sixty one sixty six, right? <coughs> so it would actually be eighteen hundred dollars more per month than what they're currently paying. If they went for that particular plan, if they went for the Anthem Silver plan, they'd be paying less. Which provides less coverage than the Not less coverage. It's going to be higher a deductible. Mo higher deductible. It'll be more out of pocket. Okay. And Mr. Blair, just to, to that to that point, I just did some calculations. Seventeen dollars fifty cents an hour is about thirty six thousand four hundred a year. And I believe that's consistent with, uh, I mean, if you say 17.50 an hour, 40 hours a week times 52 weeks. Um, so that's consistent with what our teachers are making. But, you know, fair enough. Okay. Our teachers aren't making that? I, I have to look at, yeah, I, have, I don't handle the what teachers, I don't know what their salaries are. Starting. Are starting teachers? Yeah, it's significant. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, I'll, okay, we'll, 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 we'll get that, but that's all right. But just as a way of comparison. So, those are the numbers that we're talking about. Uh, Mr. Bolero, anything else you want to bring up? Uh, I said Mr. Mr. Maddie's here. Yeah, so I do want to bring Terry up, and Terry's going to be able to talk about different plans that are out there, what the costs are, what the differences are between the plans. But, again, she's not a small, you know, a small company broker. She's the town broker, but she should be able to at least relay some information based on what's available on the exchange today, and also if there's anything else out there available. So, Terry, come on. Okay. So I'm Terry DeMatti, I'm from Siegel Consulting, and we've been the consultant, well, I've been with Siegel since 2005, so I've been with uh, the town since then for 11 years. What we do is we help you with your budgets, we help you with labor negotiations, we do budget updates, we set the rates for you because you are self-funded, and, um, you know, we try to help you save money for health care while still providing a quality plan. If you want me to, do you want me to go through these 11 plans or whatever they are and just tell you 
what the differences are. I mean, I can tell you that now the plan that the Children's Center is on is the, the town plan. It's a $15 office visit copay. Um, it's a, I believe, a $2 generic drug, $7 brand, and nothing for mail. Um, it is, I don't think there's anything to go to the hospital. There is an ER copay on it. There's no inpatient copay on it. Um, it's a it's a very rich plan that can't be found. Anymore. So, you know, as Greg said, I'm not a small group broker, but I will tell you that they can't find you wouldn't be able to find this plan in the open market. Yeah, Francis, sure. I don't the details on that, but, <laughs> but the silver um, PPO, which Greg pointed out, yes. was as fairly close. Yes, not a little less. Uh huh. What would you say the uh, biggest difference in coverage would be from their perspective. From from their perspective, the biggest difference in coverage would be that for certain services, you'd have to satisfy a deductible first before the services like are covered. Oh, the deductible. deductible. Like the 2000, 4, right. And in, in the silver case, I believe it's 3,400. Yeah, 68. 34 yeah. individuals, 68 individual family. But again, that's for the more serious issues. That's for hospitalization, outpatient surgery, et cetera. You for, you'd have to meet that before you got coverage for those big ticket so items, right? Apply for prescriptions as well. No, it does not apply for prescriptions or doctor's office visits, specialist visits, or preventive care. Oh, those things are direct access and just take a copay with the plan that Greg was talking about. So do you visits and those are covered with the copay. Things. Right. Okay. Remember under the ACA, for everybody, no matter what kind of plan you're on, I don't mean to give an insurance lesson here, but since we're here, um, preventive care is covered in full. There's no copay. So as long as your doctor codes your visit as routine preventive care, there is no copay in network. Mr. Bass. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a, a, a quick question. The town itself over the last five years, what has been the average yearly increase of their of, since we're self insured up the cost? Yeah, it's been it's been up and down. You've had some really good years, um, and you've had some bad years. So I mean, in the best years, it was a two or three percent increase. One year it was flat because the board made some changes. Um, I believe this year your rates increased significantly. And the, the, the reason for the, the it's experience. Right? It's experience. It's but claims. We're also experience. using the heft of the number of employees in the plan to yes. to negotiate the best price that you. Want. Well, I mean, the pricing. The only pricing that we need to negotiate is fixed fees, so stop loss fees and administrative fees. Otherwise, the claims are the claims because you're self-funded, you're paying claims. So when we migrate off of a municipal plan, so to speak, and go to a private plan, mm -hmm. the heft for someone seeking insurance would be different. Right. Yes. So what else can I tell you? I mean, these plans range, again, from platinum to bronze. They're Anthem and they're United Healthcare. Um, Healthy Connecticut is going out of business, so don't go there. But again, I, the, the research I did was on the Connecticut Exchange. As I said, I'm not a small group broker, but these plans are comparable. If you, you went to the carriers for small group plans, it would say these can be offered. These are offered on the uh, on the exchange. Mr. Barry, you have a question? Yeah, make, make it very simple. Sure. Okay. And in these plans, is it as good? as what they are getting now. No. That's impossible to find. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does the fluctuation up or down in the town's number of covered people, mm -hmm. say, please, mm -hmm. um, does that affect the pricing? If the membership changed significantly, then the pricing for the fixed cost would change. There are certain thresholds, certain tables we'll with insurance. Would 11 people off affect the town's rates? No. And will they be able, with only 11 people, to take advantage of what we see here on these pages? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Mr. So, just so it's clear, because it's the last thing we wasn't 
who defines eligibility the on town. a health insurance plan? The town. Okay. So can a non-employee of the town be on the health insurance plan? It's po it's town policy. Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> how many people are on our plan currently? About. Um, I think it's about 800 employees, between seven and 800, between the town and the board. And we have a catastrophic policy, right? 120 up to. You have a stop loss policy of 150,000. 150, individual stop loss, yes. Okay. Earlier, uh, the woman from the Children's Center said that, say there was a one where we went up to that stop, the mm -hmm. $150,000 claim. Mm -hmm. She said that in, in determining the rates, that would be kind of thrown out, so to speak. Is that true? Yeah. When we. When we set the budget or the healthcare company sets the claims, we set the budget, right? Because we, yeah. we see the yeah. claims. Yeah. So any catastrophic claims over stop loss, we take out because they're covered by the carrier. Um, and that's how we set the budget. You know, really, really high. I mean, 150,000 is really not a lot yeah. right now. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and then, just so I better understand with the policy of 800 people being self-insured mm -hmm. versus going on one of these plans, which mm -hmm. any of those plans, mm -hmm. do you think they're subject to higher rate hikes over time than by having the, the power of the 800 or? You know, it's a, yeah, it's a crystal ball thing only because it's a different animal. Yeah. It's the, it's the, the exchange. Yeah. It's the state of Connecticut exchange. Yeah. So last year there was a big increase, you know, some carriers pulled out, you're gonna, so I don't know, it depends on if it levels off, it, hmm? I'm here, I, I don't, I don't, I know it did, I know it did increase, but it's a whole other animal and I can't. Sure. Let me just ask you a question. So you said we have 800 employees that are insured by the town. They're not all insured with this platinum plan, though, right? They have right. varying levels of yes. insurance? Yes, right. All right. They're um, all, um, you know, negotiated through labor agreements. Because we have unions? Yes. Is there a trend that you're seeing from the town in terms of the insurance that we're offering our employees? From the, for the town? Yeah. Um, for the town and... I mean, for the, the union, uh, you know, contracts. Yeah, have. some have high deductible health plans with the health savings account that the Board of Ed contributes to. Um, some have a similar plan to the silver plan, but the deductible is much lower. And others just have a straight copay plan. Right. So it varies. Yeah, yeah, the teachers, you know, the, the majority of employees, because the board is much, you know, much larger, so the majority of employees do have a high deductible health plan with the health savings account, to which the board contributes to the account. Right. Okay. And you said the stop loss. So that, that kicks in after the town, so if there's a catastrophic injury, the town pays $150,000, right? Yep. And then a, the insurance a, a, company kicks an in. An illness, yes. Okay. And then the next year, if there's... A, uh, if, there, if there continues to be a loss or a high expense, mm -hmm. we're still going to pay another 150000 Correct. And then, you know, the insurance company will kick in. Right. Huh? Right. And in terms of rate hikes, the, the town is subject to not necessarily rate hikes as well, but differences in, in what our um, so the are. Ra so the rate hikes from the carrier, because in this case, they're really just acting as your TPA, your right. third party administrator. So the rate hikes from them. The admin fees are, are easy. We make sure that they don't charge anything more than 4% a year. The increases are at most 4% a year, you know. Um, stop loss is based on experience and it's based on their book of business experience too. So it's all a function of experience. But those are the things that we're negotiating. Could you, since we can't seem to find this data, do you have the data where you could provide for the last 10 years what the contributions were for these employees and what the that's, claims were? No, that's in, what the contributions were is an internal thing. It's what the town charges them. I have no idea. So that we could find out internally in our staff, but right. it seems we have a problem with the claims side. Could you with the claims? With that? So the claims for the children's center? For the last 10 years. Well, as far back as I can go, I can okay. do that for that you, would be if great. you if you need yeah, to. I would love that. to see that. Okay. Well, how far back can you go? Because I know we've only been able to go back four years. Yeah, I have to see. I don't know what I have. Ten years uh, is a long time. So well, I, Mr. I'll Blair, you can speak to that. I mean, I know you've been trying to get that. I was able to go back four years. I've not been able to get anything. Yeah. When we changed to Sigma in 2011, I've been able to get from July 12, 2012. 
Yeah, I, I can see what I have. I may have some of them still. And maybe that's a good chance for you to kind of address some of the claims that there's a or the numbers are off, like Ms. Johnson was saying, with your numbers that you've been presenting. How confident are you with your numbers? I'm very confident. The numbers that I've gotten come directly from Cigna, they come from that script. So I, the numbers that I've gotten regarding what the claims have come in are fully accurate. And the numbers of what we've actually been paid, I can show you, you know, by the check from 2012, what has come in. And I can categorically tell you that the town has lost to over $280,000 the last month. It's not small. What was that? It's not small change. No, it's 280000 Okay. Since 2012, four years. But I think the woman just said they have a four-year grant at $325,000 per year that comes to the town, which is $1.2 million in four years. No, no, that doesn't. I think that just goes directly to the children's yeah. town. Correct. Yeah, to provide services to the town, which in essence provides services to the town of Milford, albeit through a different organization. And just so everyone's aware, in 2014, when the teacher's contract was approved with the Board of Ed, it was $50,379 for a starting teacher with a master's degree, which would, probably, which would probably be a reason why their health insurance plan may not be as great. Without a master's degree, Mr. Zemanski? No, that's with a master's degree. No, I said without. and without, because we don't require a master's degree. Well, I was just doing a direct comparison to the Children's Center, which said they paid a little over a seven. Degree either, so they perhaps. stated on the record tonight, as well as at the last we meeting. One at a time, guys. I know. It's okay to have a conversation, I, I, just one yeah, at a time. So I have the floor. Ms. Perlow. At the last it. meeting and this meeting, they had mentioned that they had two teachers with master's degrees who were the highest paid employees who were making slightly over $17 per hour. Now, my question to you, sir, is how much do we pay in a starting teacher in our system with a basic bachelor's degree. I, I, in, instead of providing an apples to oranges comparison, I'm providing an apples to apples. It comparison. isn't an apples to apples comparison because you don't need a master's to be at the children's center, although some have them. You don't need a master's to be in our system, although some people have them. And my understanding is that the children's center, those who don't have master's degrees, are making less money. So I don't well, we don't them. know. That, that, there's another thing, too. Yeah, They're not employees. <laughs> and I'll be clear at this. I'm sure they'll get the information. We don't hire anybody at the Children's Center. We don't fire them. We don't. I mean, I'm sure they're all very well qualified, but we don't have the kind of control that you would expect over an employee like we do, say, a teacher or a teamster or a police officer. So that's the rub as well. Um, uh, yes, Mr. Can I ask you about this obsession with the control over the people at the, the Children's Center is? I mean, we've got That's how you 26, an employee. We got Mr. 20. Well, according to the other town attorney at the ask, last meeting, he said if we create an ordinance, which this body can do, we can let these folks stay on this plan. I mean, we're, we sat here, this is two meetings, we spent hours upon hours, we stressed out half the town over what, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in a hundred million dollar budget? Uh -huh. I'm sorry, this is I understand we're trying to find the uncover the gold that was in the last administration and all the deception that has been thrown around You're getting out of line. on this table for since November. I You're getting out of line, Mr. Esposito. I can be out of that line as well as back. I need to be. All I'm no, saying is we spent a lot of time over about sixty or seventy thousand dollars out of a, almost a hundred million dollar budget to help the people in this town, whether they pay the full boat or the people that can't afford so they can go to work and pay taxes, pay their car taxes, pay their town taxes, and put money into their pockets and feed their kids. You guys are Democrats and you guys are putting this stuff up? You're Democrats! <laughs> Box is outside. This uh, is a town council meeting. Seems to work this well. is a town council and the meeting. You guys are on Show a little decorum. Show a little respect. Control and control Show a little respect. The center is outrageous. You're outrageous. You're out of yes. line. Yes, thank you. You asked the question, you. right? Why, you, why are we talking thank about you. control? Thank We're talking thank about, you. ladies and gentlemen, employees. That's all a it is. Ordinance is all it would take, according to Randy DeBell. Not true. One ordinance. You can't legislate against the facts. You can't legislate against an employee. The person either is an employee or they are not. There's no legislative agree. There's no legislative decree or anything about that. You are or you aren't. There's no gray line. And if they're not, everybody admits that they're not. 
So that's why we talk about we don't have any control over them. That's what you consider an employee. If you hire them, if you fire them, that's the definition. If you talk to the Department of Labor, Workers' Comp, or anybody else to define who is an employee. And it's black and white. There's no shades of gray. Not if you talk to Cigna. <laughs> Let's see, Mr. Valero, you talk to Cigna. I what did. do they say? So Cigna actually says that this letter is to confirm that the town of New Milford benefits are designed for full-time town employees. So you have to certify who's it's an not employee. Or we have. Ms. Johnson, please sit down. You yeah. had the chance. We have this All is our chance. Now. The next meeting, we bring Cigna and Kerma and everybody that was, should be here tonight. Everybody. Before we throw out all these families and actually disrupt an, an honorable organization that's helped the town for 26 years with the help of the town and another 10 or 15 before that, I think I'd like to have everybody in the room before we cut their legs off. Cut their legs off? We're giving them an alternative that, that they pay the same amount they're paying oh, now. What is that? An exchange and accelerate. Ladies and gentlemen, we gotta have a, a conversation here. The point of the town council meeting to have an agenda item so we can discuss this. Public comment was your opportunity to discuss this and address us. That's the way the system works. You may not like it. I want to address you guys when you're speaking at public comment, but I hold my tongue so that we have this discussion with the council. I gotta ask you to do the same thing, please just as a matter of respect. Please honor the mayor's wishes here, please, folks. This is yes. not a service. Thank you. I'm supportive of you. All right, but please let us have the discussion so we can get this out there fully so that the public understands what's going on here. This shouldn't be a backroom deal or a wink and a nod or because somebody was on the board of directors back in 1990. Uh, this is taxpayer funds. Whether you agree with it or not, there are implications to considering people employees that everybody admits or not. Uh, Mr. Blair, did you have something to say? I'm sorry, I cut you off, and then we can pass. So um, I agree with everything that you're saying. It, for me, this is not a political issue. This is very, very black and white. I look at our town policy of having full-time town employees on our health benefits plan, and that's the policy that I'm administering. So that it's very, very black and white for me. It's Fair enough. Mr. Bass. Thank you, Matt. Um, Greg, first of all, thank you for doing your time and your diligence on these plans. Same oh. with thank you coming. Um, I know we are, we'd asked for you to bring us solutions, and you brought us some solutions. Um, <coughs> another solution is, as we talked about before, we all agree these are not town employees. But we also, one of the solutions that can face this council, as we've talked about before, is the ability to change the employee handbook. If this administrative body so chose to change the employee handbook, then these particular individuals could stay on the policy, correct? I guess you'd have to answer that question. We've, we've discussed that as well. Um, so it, it's a self-insured plan. If we change the employee handbook and we actually redefine what an employee is, it becomes a very slippery slope. So what you're saying. Can it it's be done? Yes, it, it, it potentially can but it comes at, at a, a much so, larger risk. Greg, I'm, I'm not saying change the employee handbook to add the Children's Center as employees of the town. Um, there may be verbiage that town attorney could talk about, I'm not an attorney, that could be crafted in such a way that these bodies, whether it be the cemetery or the Children's Center, could be added on. I think that's a conversation that when we're talking about all of these solutions, mm -hmm. I think we need, that's one of many solutions. One of, many. one of the things myself, just as, as one vote, this is a lot of information that we've gotten tonight. I know when I'm making the, 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 health, the health plans with my family, my wife and my kids, it takes a, a time once we get all the information as to what's gonna benefit us. One of the things while we're doing this, I know at the last meeting we talked about, is as we're continuing to explore these opportunities, the Children's Center still is on the same plan as it's always been, right? Status that is, quo. That is correct. They correct. are on the same Until plan we, through October 1 of 2016. Okay. That's They're correct. They're still on the same town plan, everything else, and we're still working through making these um, identifying decisions. Solutions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Can I answer any more health benefit questions for well, you? Maybe. Um, the all the talk about Kermo saying this and that, and Greg, I just want to say that we have documents here, ones from Tri Point Insurance, which I guess mm -hmm. is the Kerma rep. And he does not say 
only an employee. He said that in his opinion, we should not pay salaries or benefits to anybody who's not a town employee. I'm not a lawyer, but if I do. Okay, again, he's saying you might muddy the waters. He doesn't say that they have to be an employee. Also, Cigna, uh, Lori Craig said that she's confirming that the benefits of the town are designed for full-time employees and the town of New Milford decides and declares to Cigna who is eligible. So Correct. obviously our history shows that we have considered them to be eligible. So that's two points. The other one is this came from Kerma, you said, the liability general terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what came before or after it in, in whatever document, but under A2, you're insured as so, shown as named insured in the declarations. Okay, regarding the individual cover sections regarding who is insured. Could we get a copy of what this is referring to? Because as a standalone piece of paper, it really doesn't. It's, it's the entire Kerma declaration. Well, you don't need to give us all a copy of it, but you know, maybe yeah. send it to us in yeah. an email. I, I prefer that than more trees going down. Yeah. I, I still think that there's a, a bit of a parallel discussion going on here because the mayor has a point when he says really no one's saying that they, they don't want what they've offered us all these years. There is a cost factor and there is a point that is perceived to be a liability factor. However, there's also a little bit of a parallel in saying that, well, these are things you found and thank you for that. If I was Susan, I'd be really happy you did this and Terry explaining it to us. However, it does change something for a business, mm -hmm. a nonprofit that lives on every dime. And so I think that when you say there's a slight increase or the deductible will go up, I don't know what their coverage, I mean, I don't know what their liabilities are, what they put in for, but something that changes as much as a few percent could be the difference between them being able to offer what they offer to all the families, the 47 families. So I, I think rather than arguing and, and getting you know riled up over this again for another meeting, I would like if you, as in control of this, if you work with Terry or whomever, um, show us when you show us things like this, silver plan, which I agree looks great, okay? But in order for us to really understand it, or for anybody that's listening to understand, we need to see what does it change for them because that's the that's the crux of why we're here. Nobody would have been here these last two meetings if it wasn't for the fact that there's going to be a change which would potentially put them out of business. So with that in mind, not trying to make more work for you or for the mayor, but I think that to make it a salient discussion, which I hope it remains, we need to see that. And when you and you did give me the figures as you know when I asked independently, mm -hmm. but it would be nice if we could see this is what 50% of their people do now every year. This is what would happen then. Insurance goes up for everybody. Something along those lines, if you could. Because these are people obfuscating, using, I feel you might, it's possible. Um, I think we all know that employee is determined by the town. The town wants to use their definition, a new definition. That's one discussion. But the other discussion, which is at the heart of all of this, is what happens to Susie. Mm -hmm. The rest of us could talk about employees, not employees, all day long. All these people don't have to sit here for it. But I, I really would like to see you just put it in a comparison that we all can understand. And can we do that? And then we don't start well, You're saying like, like you did now, but have current platinum, yes, gold, answer, silver side by side. If silver side. PPO is what you deem to be the best overall looking at all those people, and you certainly know more about it than I do. But then show us what you see. I can see what they paid. Show us what you know of what they do, and then maybe let Susan look at so, it and she so can tell you So a benefit comparison yeah. saying right now hey, the office is a copay is 15 versus the silver, which right. would be. Like and we do understand that, platinum and gold that their well. plan is a Cadillac plan, and people are very lucky to have those nowadays. We know they're going away. But there are some other points to having our overall coverage from the government. So if you could just work it out so it's easier to look at. This is a lot of paper and a lot of work, and I really do appreciate that. Of course. But I think you know what the bottom line is, and that's what I think we all should want to see. Am I am I misspeaking what right we on. all might like to see? I, would, I mean, to be honest with you, sitting here feels like I'm sitting in a jury box. I've got one person telling me something on, on a complete opposite spectrum. I have another person 
telling me something on, on you know, it could be any further apart, right. and I'm supposed to sit here and decide what's the best for all of these people, and at some point, someone's not going to like me so much. Right. So I want the honest truth, the honest facts. Mm -hmm. I think the two of you should sit down and, and discuss it, mm -hmm. so when you come back, we don't have to sit through three hours and get absolutely nothing accomplished. Because right. th this might be one of the most frustrating experiences in my young 28 years. Greg, I want to yeah. thank you for all the work. Um, this, is, this is really not your job. I mean, we're doing this for the Children's Center, which sure. is not an agency, but you've come to the plate, and I think you've done a commendable job. Thank you. I have another issue that I would ask the town attorney, John, if you would reflect. The enabling legislation was in 1990, and the terms of the legislation were that the, that the Children's Center would pay 100%, and there would be no family time. It's important for me to respond to that. The key is that in 1990, all that happened was the town council voted in a resolution. And as Randy and I have talked at length about, and as he reflected the last time, that was not an action that bound the town. It was not a legislative act. Rather, all it was was a decision of a resolution. By resolution, it wasn't in the form of an ordinance. Um, and it wasn't binding on the town. It was, there's no associated contract. Uh, it's, a, it's a recitation of what the town council wanted to do. It's, we don't view it as any, any form of legal undertaking that's binding on our town. Rather, what's important is the decision at hand is one, well, there's, there's two, two real decisions. One is, there's been a decision, I believe, by the chief executive officer of the town, working, which is the mayor, working with his personnel director. There's a couple of ordinances that give the personnel director his, presently it's a his, responsibilities. Those responsibilities include overseeing, implementing, and administering the personnel director, uh, uh, directives and benefits of the town. Uh, across the town for personnel purposes. So I believe he's been acting with the chief executive officer and making the decision, which was articulated in a letter to the Children's Center, which basically gave them a three month window uh, of warning that the town was no longer going to abide by. And that was an executive determination that they were not employees under the Cigna plan. Now, there's a second decision that I think that's, that's presents before us, which is the possibility of a legislative act of the town council. And I believe the town council could do this in possibly as many as three different ways. One would be, I, well, let me just say first, we do not think it's advisable to try to amend the personnel code, because the personnel code itself is a body of, uh, of, of rules that apply only to municipal employees. So that's going to be very difficult. So the first way I would say quickly is an ordinance. Second way, less, less advisable, would only be a one-year stopgap, would be, in your discretion, a supplemental appropriation that would cover the shortfall that it would be facing the Children's Center if they were pulled out from the health insurance plan. You understand that you, you are appropriating 78500 but you are effectively giving them uh, a form of, of subsidy by allowing their employees to be eligible on that Cigna plan, which the executive branch has determined is not going to be viable in the absence of legislative act. The third, I don't think is advisable at all, which would be uh, if, if you found some type of public emergency to exist, uh, which I don't think exists, you'd have to find a threat immediately to lives, health, or property of persons. I don't really think that applies, but you can, there is a charter provision that allows you to adopt an emergency ordinance but I think the, uh, the proper way would be a Section 406 ordinance, uh, which would have to require a public meeting. Uh, you have to have a public hearing, I'm sorry, public hearing, not a public meeting. A public hearing on that ordinance it would have to be written very carefully to uh, exclude the exact concerns that uh, the personnel director and the mayor have about uh, uh, you know, making sure that this ordinance is not used as evidence to establish an employer-employee relationship or other kinds of liability exposures to the town. So I've said enough, I hope that's clear. 
Thank you. This is a very wonderful explanation to the question I didn't ask, but <laughs> that's okay. I'll ask it again. You did say that there yeah. was legislation. There wasn't any legislation. Okay. When I get the action that the town council took, it was to allow the children's center to go on our policy, that they would pay 100% and there would be no families. My question to you, I think was, uh, I think there was some language at one point of uh, employee plus one, plus one, right. which I never understood. Right. House or a, All right. My question is yep. that if we resolve this, knowing that that was what the intent of the council was in 1990, what do we do about the fact that they're paying 70 percent? There's nothing in the record that that allowed them to re to reduce it from 100 percent to 70 percent or have families. But, but knowing that that was the original intent of the council, do we have to go back to what they said in 1990? In your legislative action now, you're not bound by what the town council did in that resolution. There's no binding contract that was formed in 1990 between the, the children's center and the town in our view. So what did it, what did, what did it accomplish? It, it basically articulated, uh, we think, uh, it was a, a policy that was articulated resolution that was then followed and deferred to by the chief executive officer for, I believe, 26 years. Wow. Right. I understand why Jeff was concerned. Here's what I'm going to su suggest in light of the options so that we give Greg and myself some guidance as, as to where we're going with this. I, I would entertain a motion if there is support for uh, passing an ordinance that redefines uh, an employee to include the children's center and employees for purposes of the health insurance, then that's a motion that should be made now. And if it doesn't carry, then um, you know we could address offering these different plans that are um, comparable in terms of price. But that's where I think we're at. I'd like to see a comparison before we make that type of decision here. I mean. So we can discuss that in a right, and then we can get it side by side <laughs> in the near future. I mean, we have till October. Okay. Yeah, this is the best. Thank you, Mayor. I'll make that motion. Uh, if I have a second, I mean, I'll speak. I'll, second. To, I'll speak to the motion. Um, I think that by uh, doing the motion, they can help the process. It can help everybody know that we're moving forward. It gives uh, Greg an opportune time, such as yourself, and all parties involved an opportunity to craft the legislation if this body speaks to uh, move forward or not move forward. So I think this is a very proactive thing to do. And uh, I would, you know, I don't know what date that you'd like to set for it. I mean, maybe you can bring it back to the next meeting what, when you'd want us to. Put that on the agenda because I know you guys. Well, I'm opposing the motion, that. so I'm hoping okay. there won't be a date. But uh, it, it, to speak towards that, I will go on the record and say that I don't believe, I, I respect Attorney Tower, your opinion, <laughs> but I don't believe that you could legislate against uh, um, facts. And in this case, we do have very specific facts. They're not the ones that we um, assumed in the past, they're not the ones that we like. But the fact is that there is a, a, a legal definition of what an employee is. Um, it's, there's a ton of case law and regulations from the Department of Labor on down regarding that. And I think playing around with these legal definitions to include a, um, a subset of the community is dangerous, especially <laughs> since we've offered a reasonable alternative that basically maintains the status quo financially and um, you know reflects what the town is moving towards as a policy even on its own health insurance policies for its uh, employees um, so mr. Barrett did you have your hand up? yeah I, I, I have a problem with that with that motion uh, I heard first that looking for a comparison I had a, I had asked the question is this policy going to be comparable obviously if uh, what has been presented, the gold, the platinum, the silver, is not comparable. It's going to be a change for these people, even though it may cost them less money. But now you're talking about family, you're talking about a deductible, you're talking about co-pays. I would rather go back as directed uh, 
for that comparison before I take a look or, or, or vote on, on a, a motion such as that. Uh, it's a conundrum that we have right before us. Your point is well taken. The attorney's point is well taken. Um, I am uncomfortable with the motion. I, I would echo uh, Councilman Bear's uh, position. Not that I'm not open to the, the concept of what's on the, the floor here, because I am. Um, I just don't think we have enough specificity as to what we would be doing. So in that regard, um, yeah, I, I agree. I'm in agree with, okay. agreement with my colleague. And uh, just uh, go Mr. Bass after me. And then, so what it sounds like I'm saying is that there is no overwhelming support for the ordinance, but there's not necessarily a, a not looking to make a de decision on um, the uh, alternative plans as well until you get more information. That's fair a fair statement. Just as a point of order, yes. did we suspend the rules to add this motion to the agenda? No, we did not. So the motion's not. improper to begin with. Okay, which sounds like it might be, you know, appropriate anyway. I, I just have one question for, for Attorney Tower to clarify. Can we create an ordinance that would provide health insurance to the Children's Center and to the Town Cemetery, wherein they would not be designated as employees, they would be required to provide their own workman's comp and be required to provide their own liability insurance. So that the concerns that we have, which was one, all these other agencies coming out would be avoided, two was a workman's comp concern, three was a liability concern, four was the employee concern, all of those issues would be addressed. Could such an ordinance be crafted? And, and could I add one part uh, to the gentleman's question? And would there be any due process issues for other potentially eligible agencies such as the VNA or Meals on Wheels and so forth? Well, it's, it's our opinion that you, we could craft such an ordinance. It would take very careful yeah. scrutiny. Yeah. And it would be based to, to address uh, Councilman Chandler's concern. It would be addressed in a fashion that would be narrowly tailored to <coughs> the full-time employees of, let's say, in this case, it would be the Children's Center of New Milford, Inc., or alternatively, New Milford Center Cemetery Association. Those are the two entities you're talking about. And it would be based upon a finding that they, they perform functions that are deemed by the town to be important uh, services for the municipality itself. And we have to keep an eye on uh, our provision, our statutes that allow, that give certain powers to municipalities, but we think that such an ordinance could be crafted. It would also have to be meshed with the present uh, third-party administered uh, self-insured plan, uh, the Cigna plan, uh, which I agree with his honor, the mayor, that uh, right now that plan is written to address only employees. Mm -hmm. uh, but such mm -hmm. an ordinance, we think, uh, could be blended with that. So the way that it's written could be crafted in such a way that, say, Meals on Wheels or whatever other organizations were came would then have to request a new ordinance, so to speak, or a modification to the ordinance? Yeah, I don't think that, uh, it's, it's not like such an ordinance would give any uh, nonprofit standing to, you sure. know, to Thank participate. You. It, would, it would name those two nonprofits and limit it to those. Mr. Mayor. I hear I wear a, a, what Councilman Samansky is saying. In a sense, we're talking about something that's 26 years old, so it should be grandfathered. Yeah. And let's and let's move on. Yeah. Move on with that. Exactly. Yes. You got you got something that's been in effect now for uh, 20, 26 years old. I am not sure at the full knowledge of the taxpayer, but it's been in existence for twenty six years. I hear you, Mr. Bear. Okay. Fair enough. For me, right and wrong is whether it's one day, one year, or 26 years. And if you're gonna address it, you, you do it right. You do it by an ordinance. But continuing to do this in the way that it's been done for the 26 years is just flat out wrong. Not because of anything that the Children's Center did, but because of the way the town's been handling this. And it's not looking back, as Mr. Esposito said, prior administrations. These are Democrats, these were Republicans, it's not political. It's 
simply improper. Uh, it's bad bookkeeping. We should be able to look towards something to say exactly why something exists the way it is and what the authority is for it so that it's not subject to discretion. And if you pass an ordinance to do that, then that will be binding on subsequent um, administrations. Um, but there is a process. Mr. Ms. Uh, Lundgren. Um, my concern about passing an ordinance like this that's just going to include the Children's Center and the cemetery is that um, the other organizations in town that possibly would be eligible for this um, could possibly consider it discrimination that they're not going to be considered in the ordinance. And I, then I think if we're going to open it up to one, we have to open it up to everybody or, or to none, basically. It's going to be That's a fair enough for discussion. And that, that has been you know, one of the concerns about the slippery slope that I, this kind I of does. I share that concern, but my other concern comes in. And I'm going to be sitting at this very table tomorrow with AFSCME and with our unions. We are offering our other employees and employees of the town health benefits that do not compare to the plan that the Children's Center is on. And it's, it's a major concern when the union is asking me, well, why can a non-town employee have this insurance plan? And I can't. Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, the, uh, the thing about grandfathering, um, we, those of us in any town who lived long enough to see times change, many things are grandfathered in. The lack of sidewalks, needing sidewalks, lack of height of buildings, lack of tall towers, cell towers, solar panels, you name it. Where can a gas station be? Where can it be? And we all know that, particularly in rural areas and smaller towns, that it does happen. That something that's been there forever, it's like eminent domain or right of own, you know, using something. So we have two things, which encompasses now 13 people, both of which the loss would impact the town. The cemetery would be a rather expensive impact because we'd have to replace those two people if they take a hike. So. I, I understand that grandfather is not a, a legal necessarily. It actually is okay. in zoning. Well, in there zoning you go. Situations, there you go. Well, I was in the planning, so right. I think that it's not. I think it's something to think about when we talk about this because we're not talking. When Mary Jane's point is well taken, but I think that we're talking about entities that have been around really a, a long time, long enough to be truly grandfathered, and that. As our town attorney just said, is could we could craft an ordinance that would exclude anybody but these two entities? And I just think, personally, that's what we should consider and look into it. I'm not saying that's the way it's got to be, but I think we have to consider it. Let me say something towards that. So, grandfather, I understand what you're saying. When when a gas station is grandfathered in, you know the zoning regulations have changed after it. It's it's grandfathered. This isn't a grandfathered situation. Number one, it's it's money that this is taxpayer funds and number two this gets renewed every single year so for 26 years we have added every year at the end of you know the end of the fiscal year we re-add them and when we sign a new contract with our health insurance company we are affirmatively adding them again when they hire a new employee we are Greg's got to certify and send something to the insurance company that says here's a new employee that's going to be added to our plan so it's not like it was done one and done back in 1990. This is constant, and that's why it's it's not static. It, it requires daylight to kind of address how we got here and why, and to discuss whether this is the way that we want to conduct the government business in the future, or is there a reasonable alternative in the uh, form of these private health insurance plans. And that's the discussion that we're having right now. I might Fair just enough. respectfully yep. say when you bring up the budget and fiscal that for 26 years, I've not been on the council all those years. However, I know that the last time we decided to take some money away from them, mm -hmm. the town absolutely said how they felt about that. Sure. And when we discuss our budget and things are taken out and nitpicked and whatever, I don't, I, Rarely ever, except just recently, did it ever come up we should take money away. And no taxpayers ever come to me to say, I really wish we didn't have to give them that money. Sure. I, I, I mean, I think we're here, us, 
you know, you're, you're elected, good, we're not, we're here because somebody voted us in. We're and, elected, well, we're, we're not elected, paid. But we're not paid, right. Sure. We're elected because people want us to do what's right, and a majority of people have said to me and others, I think, that they think this is right. Now, the legality of it, and the, your way of looking at it from the town, which you should do, might be different. I just think that when a taxpayer isn't revolting because we've, we've been giving them this stipend all these years, that's something we have to consider. Just so you, you know, we're not being obstructionists, it's just I think that's a consideration we're charged with. And I think if you go the, the route of the ordinance, hopefully you will get, you know, the public participation and the daylight on it to, to clarify once and for all. Right. You're right, the budget line, 78,500, that's in there, it's identified, and it's got daylight. But I would wager most people do not realize that the town provides health insurance and and that's an important benefit that you know if we can't I can't open a book and explain well how do we get to the 7030 the finance director just tells me they pay 7030 my first question is why um, why not 50 50 you know why does the cemetery pay 10 percent and the, the the town pays 90 um, why and, and that's where this whole thing has come from why we look back and we look at the resolutions and we say, okay, it was 100% back in 1990, and somewhere along the way we got away from that. There was no daylight. Um, so we've got some daylight on the issue now. You hear from the public. Um, yeah, fair enough. Uh, yeah, Mr. Baird. <laughs> this may be simplistic on my part. Those that are now on the program, they are fro let, them, let them be frozen in place. Any new employee goes by the books, they'll have to opt for one of these new plans, whether it's silver, platinum, gold. Is that, a, is that another scenario? That's, that's an option, absolutely. I mean, anything's an option. Is that an option? Sure. Those that are there, they are frozen. Sure. They're there. Right. They're grandfathered. Mm -hmm. Anybody coming on board has to opt for one of these that new plans. That's a fair there. consideration that it sounds like okay. we're going to have. I think we should oh. see everything. Yeah. If we could see a right. copy of a draft right. ordinance, if we could see an option like that, if we could oh. see all of these plans side by side with what we're offering them now and everything else, oh. I think we've got to throw everything okay. out there and let's look at it all. Fair enough. Let's look at it all. All right. So we've got our next uh, meeting in August. So I'm sure Greg will have more information and more updates at that point. To, you know, we've got one other thing, not, not mm -hmm. good, guys, but we've got a position to update. More money. <laughs> yes, I know. We can move on to item B on that, uh, that on the agenda. We can advance of the meeting by like a week, so we have time to review it to make everything. Uh, as long as we get it, it wasn't since we're formalized. Like, just there was no suspension. It was not on the agenda, and there was no motion. So essentially, I can just point it out. Yeah. 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 All right. Sure. So, all right. Next thing I want to talk to you. Next agenda. Yeah, we'll keep yes. coming back with updates. Huh? That's all. Yeah. So that's the August twenty second. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So nine B. Talk to you. Make a motion. Mr. Mayor. On which one? Yeah. On nine uh, B. Yes. Mr. Mayor. Mayor. We'll yes, Mr. Mayor. I don't think I don't think he's finished. Oh. Yeah, no, he's 9B. talking about 9B. Yeah, yeah, not, talking about 9, 9B, so yeah. the purchasing specialist. Uh, let's make a motion first and then there'll be a discussion. All right, I'll make a motion to approve yeah, right. the proposed changes to the purchasing agent job description pursuant to Charter Section um, 1202. Okay, discussion. Uh, Mr. Valero, can you just discuss first of all how we got here and then we'll take questions. Okay, so, um, you know, we've got a committee that's going to be updating all of our job descriptions and we're going to be updating the personnel code as well. Um, the purchasing uh, clerk actually left in the beginning, well, in the middle of June, so we've been without a purchasing specialist since June, I think, 15th. So it, just in order of getting somebody in place as crucial of a position as it is, I've put this job description into the new format that's going to be out. Does everybody have a copy of it? You do? Okay. So what I've been able to do, I've been sitting with our finance director, the person that this person will ultimately report into. Um, we've analyzed what the position is today versus what it also needs to be, what the requirements are going to be. So we've added several different functions, uh, requests for proposals, requests for quotes, um, all of the bid process, closing bids, just the overall level of this. So I've, I've recommended a couple of things for the job description. You'll see it's in the new format. This is actually more of a paragraph position rather than bullet points. Um, we did increase the grade from grade 12 to grade 13. 
uh, which the union is appreciative of. The union has looked at this. They have signed off on it. They're, they're fully on board. Um, what we've also done is we have increased the minimum qualifications. It's gone from three years to five years. We're also requiring a bachelor's degree for the position. Um, from the minimum skills and abilities, we've also increased several things there. It really fully around the experience that's going to be needed to handle the level of this position. So, um, does anyone have any specific questions I'm regarding? Yeah. Uh, I just noted a couple of things. I, I did read this in the paragraph one. It took me a little longer. Do you have under knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, a offer of equipment, et cetera, up to 20 pounds? Mm -hmm. And over the under on your XP is 1,500. You know, never, frequently, constantly. You do reference the medium work of 20 to 50 pounds occasionally. Occasionally. So, so. I believe, just to be bookkeepers with this, you should mention that up here in the job description. Okay. Because it does state only up to 20. The other question I had was under driving, it says never. Um, I was a purchasing manager for several years, and I did have to drive to see people, and I believe our purchasing manager also has to go to the bank. So, I don't know that Mary ever went to the bank. Yes, she did. She did yeah. go to the bank? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that yeah. I have, All the time. I only was working with her for two and days, so only that, because that we can I, update. It kind of precludes if you ever needed the person to do it. We kind of hope they can get to work, and I suppose that would have to be driving. I don't know, I just wonder why it was accepted more than anything. Where does it say that? Where is this the on the uh, X marks, oh, what okay. you do. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. And I never knew that we had a, a low and a high temp. Um, what is the difference, Greg? Um, not, not talking about Marilyn, who was here for 28 years or whatever, but um, between the salary mm -hmm. base between a 12 and a 13 grade? It's about $2 an hour. Oh. I see. So, and how many dollars an hour got over? So, she merely was making 57, I think I've got the actual numbers here. 61 or something like that? Yeah, it takes her just over 60. Hang on just one second. And you have So, currently it's 57, 283, 20. The proposed range takes this. Yeah, it's going to be 63, 835, 20. But, you know, one of the reasons for the justification around the cost increase, when I look at the other towns and, and what the purchasing person is actually making, um, right. you know, as I look at New London, they're making a 68. You know, it's, it's a very, I just wanted a question and somebody else can ask you. On this list, which is working conditions, mm -hmm. I don't know how this plays out as far as our liability or whatever, but one of the things that's, that you have marked here is uh, physical danger, mechanical hazards, does this in any way put the town in a bad situation if, you know, somebody comes in and holds everybody hostage? Could a simple employee use this type of document to say, I signed on to never have any physical danger? As a as a um, part of their, you guys know better than I do. Yeah, as a part of part of their job description, this is not like it would be for a police officer where you could actually quote what the physical danger would be. Okay, so this is sort of just an over. It's not a guarantee. Yeah, this is not right. This it. this is more along the lines like of the ADA I, I for what to be expected. So I mean, I just, I no, that's fair enough. Yep. That's, Go ahead. I didn't know we had this. Any other, Mr. Bass? Thank thank you, Mayor. Um, Greg, is, uh, is any, has this job been posted internally yet? It has not been. I mean, it needs town council approval for it to be posted. Has anybody uh, asked uh, you about this position yes. that, that's been yes. in town hall? I mean, been in the employee? Yeah, and have employees asked me about the position? Yes. yes, they have. And what was the reasoning for changing the minimum qualifications? In the level of the position. What, what this position has grown to over the last 30 years. It, I know that it was updated in 2005, but it hasn't been updated in 11 years since then. And just the level of contracts that have been coming in, uh, Merrily actually started, I think some of her highest contracts were in the, the thousands, mm -hmm. not even tens of thousands of dollars, and now they're in the millions of dollars. So needing an experienced person in this is, is critical. And my, my last question is, does this requirement, does the person need to be bonded? I don't believe that they're required to be bonded, but I have to check on that. that I don't need to know. They're not dealing with funds. Yeah. Oh, they'll, they'll be dealing with funds because they're going to be handling yes. collections and, yeah, they're going to be processing over. 
purchase motives. So would that be would that be something that you would want to recommend or have you thought about? That didn't even come across my mind to be honest. And I'll be honest, Greg, I mean everybody in the finance department deals with funds. So right. I mean the I only mean, bonding requirement I believe is the tax collector. Is the tax collector. I don't I don't even know who he is bonded with you. I think so. Okay. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, Mr. Smith. So, do we have the last job description actually approved by the town council from 2005? It's the first page. It's the first page. Mm -hmm. I've got copies here. Oh, that's just this. Yeah, it's just right. on top. Oh, because yeah, that said 2015 version, but that's also what was last approved by the council. That wasn't approved. Yeah, that wasn't approved. It was just 2005 that it was actually okay. approved. Okay. So, now if someone has a four-year degree, they can apply for the job of one-year experience, basically. Correct. Correct. With the degrees. And you feel that's sufficient? If they've got a degree and they've got experience in the field, I feel as though that they would have the expertise to be able to come in and learn the job. Okay. I think otherwise five years of experience is really going to be what's necessary to learn this position. They'll have supervision from the finance director, so they're not going to be left out, you know, hanged to dry. And the original job description had uh, a background check and a uh, credit check. That's no longer in there? I think we do that yeah, anyway. We do that for every employee. Yeah, it's not part of the job description. Yeah, not, it doesn't well, have to be actually, actually on the job description. Yeah. With one of the last employees that was hired that wasn't in a court. So just to clarify, a background no, we, check. We do a background check and a credit check for every new hire. Okay. They do that. Okay. Thanks. Any further discussion? So there was a change, Katie, that you had mentioned. Will that be incorporated? Uh, we can issue with incorporating that. Either either remove the move the X over or put it in the words. Only because you just never know. As you know, you're in the HR business. You might ask me to pick up that typewriter, and I'm going to say. Uh, uh. That's fair enough. And then moving the driving uh, X over as well. Yeah, right. yeah that's to so to occasional I'm rather than ever. Yep. The X oh, yeah. what driving is. So yeah, the, the X for driving will go from no to occasional, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And okay. And what was the other one? The 50, the 50 to 100 pounds is, uh, and in the description it says only 20 pounds. Right. It says 20 to 50, and in the description it just states 20. So either take move the X on the chart or add 50 in here into the paragraph because so it's tw it's right. 20 to 50. Right. Yeah. So well, it's not inconsistent actually. Yeah. In your opinion, Greg, I mean, if because this was reviewed by the union also in terms of lifting weights, you know, I don't I don't think anybody expects well, what 50 has, pounds. What has more? Yeah. All right, the, the, the job description will carry more weight. Well, yeah. This this document is more to cover us from an ADA perspective and setting what the expectations around what the job reasonably would expect. Okay. So, okay. 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 Are we adding something to the description? And occasional driving. Wait, up to you. No, I, I guess if you're saying we don't need to. If we don't really need to change the poundage yeah. if this isn't the determining document when I go to file suit. Not the job. Right. So no changes okay. to the poundage. Okay, so right. just moving the driving to occasion. Yeah. Okay. So. <coughs> okay. With that change, uh, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council. All right. Thank you, Thank you, Greg. Have a wonderful couple of weeks. Enjoy the summer. We'll see you on the 22nd. Unless anybody and hopefully, to you know, the subcommittees will be coordinating with Greg going forward also. I mean, we're going to get into it a little bit later, but if he's going to leave um, the uh, personnel code, the job descriptions, um, Greg will start coordinating, I guess, with the subcommittees to, to get those underway. That All sounds right. good. Great. I'll shoot out emails and... Okay. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Item 10 on the agenda is public motion. works. I make a motion to authorize David R. Gronbeck to sign enter and enter into a contract with Motorola Solutions for all radio system maintenance, support, and communications. Okay. okay. Um, this is the, um, the radio equipment to maintain our emergency radio equipment. Um, and we do have it with Motorola already. It's a, um, a continuation. So, any further discussion? Yes, Mr. Smith. What account was this budgeted for? 
Uh, Public Works has this budgeted in their accounts. Um, I don't have the exact designation, but it was um, identified previously. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Item 11, Household Waste Collection Day. Make a motion to authorize David R. Gronbeck to sign and enter into a contract with MXI Environmental Services, LLC, for the purposes of running the Hazardous Waste Collection Day on September 17, 2016, from 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. at the John Pettibone property. Second. Okay. This is something that we do every year through um, HRRA and, and Suzanne Park, Beth on Holtz who is our representative, is coordinating this. Uh, the only change in prior years is that, you know, we do have the Pettibone property available where I believe it was previously held. Um, there have been concerns about the logistics of having it at the um, train station parking lot. So this is considered a, an improvement and everybody involved yeah, is, is very fun. excited to use the property again. It, it provides better logistics for the, um, the turn and everything else. So, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Item 12 on the agenda. Uh, 12A, we had discussed this, we didn't get to it the last um, town council meeting. This is the uh, creation of a sub-account within the Capital Reserve Fund. You'll see 12A is a resolution that does address the protocol that we initially discussed when we uh, brought this up to the town council. Um, I'll entertain a motion. Okay. Um, move uh, the creation of a sub account within the town's capital reserve fund to be funded by unexpand unexpanded surplus funds for public works, police department, parks and rec, recreation as may be available at the end of each fiscal year. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Yes, Mr. Spansky. So this is to adopt the resolution or packet that was 12A, not that not what was just discussed, just to be clear. So we're adopting the resolution as ordered? Right, yeah, 12A. So what's the definition of healthy for the fund balance? I see. You know, I guess that's subject to interpretation. You know, it depends on what our auditors tell us. Um, from a financial point of view, what uh, the bond companies look at. Uh, and that's, I guess, a moving target that depends on, you know, the town council at the time. It's a hard term to define, but it's something that, when we were discussing the uh, the resolution itself, they wanted that to be a consideration. Um, our uh, surplus accounts, um, we wanted to take that into consideration before designating any funds for this capital account. Uh, so that's why that's in there. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, should this res resolution be read right into? Uh, I mean, it, since it does uh, give a lot of responsibility to the town council in considering transfers of funds. Sure, it's fair enough. If um, we, we could read it, Mr. Chamberlain, I know you had a comment. Um, uh, a question: yeah. Is this effectively somewhat a memorialization of what has been the traditional practice of allowing agencies that have surpluses? to carry over uh, balances from year to year. I know it has been a, a practice or something that has happened, but... No, it's different from what's, what's happened. It's, it's more of a, for lack of a better word, copying what we do for the Board of Ed to encourage efficiency on their end and where they get to benefit from the result of it by funding their capital reserve funds as we see now, they've got a chiller that needs to be replaced and they don't have to come back to the town council to do that. It's on a smaller scale to do that with regard to these departments as well. Right now, you carry enforced individual funds, uh, but it doesn't, it stays within that account that it was previously budgeted. This would actually mirror what, what happens with, I see you Frank, I'll get to you in one second. This mirrors what we do with uh, Board of Ed, where we create a sub-account within the department for capital non-recurring expenditures, uh, so it would actually move it out of whatever individual uh, line item it's in and, and create an aggregate kind of fund. So that's the the, the big change is the removal of the uh, aggregate title? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Warga. Yeah, just from a history standpoint, the budget goes from year to year. 
So if you've got money in your line item, let's say you got $20,000 to replace a furnace, and you only spend $15,000, and you replace the furnace, you have $5,000. You either spend it by transferring it to another account, or it goes away. So it happens at the end of the year, there's a flurry of activity to try and find out places where I can spend this money. This allows them to have a pot that the money can go in, so they don't have to make rash decisions. They can accumulate money to get towards a meaningful pro For instance, they could, they could take the money and buy a truck if they really need it. Uh, they can't do that now. So this but, is what that does. But what the, the purpose of my question is that on an individual basis, on an agency to agency basis, people have, rather than spending out their surpluses at the end of the year, have made requests, a good example being is the cemetery, asking that a, a non-purchased truck allotment be carried from year to year, and I gather that particular truck allotment's been carried up along several years. So I guess what I'm asking is, is this basically, Does a similar type of thing for these particular agencies, except that they don't have to go back to us and ask specific permission? You mean does it exist right now? Okay. No, you know this is this is, the, like and to use Frank's example, you got twenty thousand dollars budgeted for something, fifteen thousand dollars is spent right now. There's no. There's no reason or, or nor incentive to not spend that five thousand dollars on something else, and, and a lot of times it does get spent um, because there's there's a, there's a kind of uh, idea that if you don't spend what you're budgeted for, you're going to lose it in the next year's budget. This will reward them for you know taking that five thousand dollars now and saying we have it at the end of the year and putting it in this account. Maybe we're along with a couple of other five thousand dollars, and you get up to twenty, and in a couple of years you're up to sixty, seventy, or eighty. And you've got a nice chunk of change to, uh, um, you know, buy something that really does come up in an emergency, uh, and will actually save uh, the town money at the end of the day. Yes. Talk about say, saying stay in force is when you have a budgeted item like, you know, we wanted to pave Windemic, but the weather wasn't good, and and a, and a project such as the renovation is coming up, so they kept that money in force right. to stay within that account. That's an appropriate in force Car appropriate carryover. Right. As the mayor is saying, yeah, that, that's a really good, good example. Exactly. You're doing a good job of saving right. money, and you take a twenty thousand dollar allocation, and you can, and you only spend fifteen. You should, you know, should, you should right. go into an account. But that there is still generate. some oversight with us. It isn't yeah. necessarily right. a dollar for dollar. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Well, it's all at our discretion. Okay. Well, yeah. kind of like what we do the the, uh, the board of that. But yes, Mr. Well, Francis. just to say, this isn't, and I get what you're saying here that, that this isn't to foster in any uh, department. <clears throat> that they shouldn't do the best with oh, their no, money right. to put it. I mean, that's why we have the town council mm -hmm. as an oversight of this, and I don't think Absolutely. it will. I think it'll foster some uh, consideration as an incentive as it's meant. Right. I, I think so. You're not gonna, it's not going to undercut their ability. Nobody's going to be you know, cutting back on something just so that they can kind right. of save this. Right. But throughout the course of a year, you do realize savings, and you do realize efficiencies, and yes. it's important yeah. to reward that. Um, it's the best. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do like this idea. It's a good idea. Um, question for town attorney. You've reviewed it. Does not impinge on any kind of charter or it, you have any concerns? Two, two quick things, Your Honor. Uh, I want to point this out that on the agenda, uh, the item is going to be limited per, uh, to the Public Works Police Department and Parks and Rec mm -hmm. on, on the agenda, but the proposed resolution is speaking, it, it's not so limited. Part. So I wanted, right. Your Honor, to reconcile that. I don't want to think about inserting, if it's going to be limited to those three agencies oh, to do right. so. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. You know, originally, that, and I think that's where we are, right, so originally the idea was it's mostly public works and, and police and parks and rec, but then as I actually got into writing this, um, the IT department said, hey, you know, every once in a while I save some money too, and it wouldn't be a bad idea for me to carry it over. So without being, a, I, I think that's the intent is to start with these three um, departments and, and it's very simple administratively for us to set up sub accounts through the finance right. department but I wrote the resolution so that we could keep it open so that other agencies could benefit as well if, if it if it came up can, if it was appropriate one more thing uh, uh, to, to answer the question fully um, 
1995, the town council created the capital reserve fund. Yeah. These monies will be going into that, which is the same fund that the educational and the town side monies go in. Once it goes in there, it can only go out for two different things. One is a capital expenditure, or the other is a non-recurring expenditure. And I just wanted your, so the council to see right. that it's sure. effectively a lockbox uh, for purpose. Yeah, but all into one account. It's all into one account, except you might remember that the capital reserve fund has got a segregation within Correct. it of between the board of ed and the town side. But now this is going to be a these will be additional segregation. Additional so this will be sub accounts, sub account within public the town works, side. sub account, sub parks and rec, sub account. So that yeah, no, no another one department is not going to can't benefit take, from from, from the, the efficiency the of, of another one. Yeah, another. very fair. And yeah, we believe this very is fair. because it's under the capital reserve fund statute that your actions, Mike, is going to be bound binding on. Town councils in the future. I mean, it's going to so, be. This is going to be a practice. Right. So my 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 follow my follow up question is, the way that it's going to be segregated, council has purview over the surpluses. Can council then move one line item from one body from one segmented sub to another? Well, the way you set up the capital reserve fund, you are not able to move the board of eds portion of that to the town side. And it was my understanding that this was going to be set up in a way that if, if, if the money is landed from the police department, your remark, Stays with them. It, it was not going to be transferable within it. Okay. Sure. But I, I, it may want to be, the resolution may want to address that. I don't think it, right. I don't think it is as tight as it is. A question on your earlier point, that is that capital and non-recurring yes. or capital or non-recurring? It, it's it's and capital and non-recurring. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Mayor, another yep. a kind of a follow-up too. So, uh, to what Councilman Szymanski had said, is there uh, a way that you and the uh, finance uh, department can kind of give us some kind of guide rails on healthy and other considerations, so that when this does come before us at that time, we're not spending a lot of man hours on what we think may or may not be something we kind of have some guide i hear you i mean i incorporated that because it was you know miss francis one of your suggestions was to consider um you know our fund balance so i mean maybe it's just with consideration uh of the fund balance without what identifying with the healthy what a percentage i don't think so we don't have Is those so those guidelines right we're not locked right in right now maybe balance. it's just maybe it's just consideration of the uh, fund balance i mean i put healthy in there because that's what we're looking to maintain, but um, it is amorphous. You know, you could say you're going to consider the fund balance, and when you pass a resolution, I'm just looking forward because this might have to be mm -hmm. grandfathered in. So I was thinking of the future <laughs> councils. Sure. Well, I'm thinking that we as a council could be looking at different factors in different circumstances. How sure. healthy is the town? Right. How healthy is the agency? Right. What are we looking up down the road? Exactly. So I, I really think we want to leave ourselves that latitude. If you want to say with consideration to maintaining um, the fund, the town's fund well, balance. I think I think that there's no way to escape having discussion if and when something comes up. I think mm -hmm. the, sure. I understand not wanting to, but I don't know that there's a way to get around it. There's nine people here, and sure. we all have a, an opinion. And I think each safe. time you know there, there's a request to do this. There'll be a report from the finance department that says, you know, our our fund balance is X. You know, I I would recommend that's a healthy fund balance, both by you know our rating agency and you know put them on the hook so that it makes your job easier. You don't have to well, necessarily and do it and in back. And I bring up mayor, mm -hmm. and then the other one is other considerations. So I'm sure. just wondering, like, what would another? That's I leave it open. I have emergency. you don't you don't know what town emergency. Right. And may I just ask, this More is probably a legal thing, right. but do you, is um, quoting healthy correct in this type of thing, in this sort of a situation? Well, just because it's it's not really a, uh, it's quoted because it's it's not a legal term, it's okay. not, uh, <laughs> it's, broad. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a broad okay. kind of descriptive term. Right. Could, yeah. you, well, yeah. it's, it's Could you change from healthy to recommended? Healthy well, to maintaining. Um, Get a lot of points with that word. It's got the dictionary. Okay, fair enough. To address your comments earlier, Pete, I mean it does say, you know, in the um, in the paragraph above, which will be a sub account within the departments for capital non-recurring expenses. 
So that was put in there to make sure that it was segregated for the department, not to be moved around. Um, yes, Mr. Szymanski. Technically, though, shouldn't it be within a sub account uh, within the capital reserve fund, not by department? Within the. Yep. Okay. What is it going to be? Capital reserve fund. Within the capital reserve fund by department. Yes, yes, exactly. You said that earlier. Capital reserve by in the department. Which will be sub account. Which will be sub account. Which will be sub account within the capital reserve account. Or capital nine. Right. Works for me. So we're taking it off of that seat. Right. 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 So it's going to just be the three departments that are going to work for now. Police. You yeah. tell your grandchildren. Yeah. No, and we can always. I think the resolution leaves it open to add to that, and I'll come before you to say, you know, I think it's appropriate to add an account for IT or um, the health department has extra money. All right. Do you want me to read this? Um, but I don't think we need to set up all these accounts if they're never going to be used. Okay. All right. All right. I'll read. So be it resolved that before the end of the fiscal year, the departments of Public Works, Police Department, and Park and Rec with the Mayor's Office and Finance Department will identify the accounts with surplus funds expected at the end of the fiscal year. Following the audit, a presentation will be made to the Town Council with a request to tran transfer such surplus funds into an incentive capital account, which, we, which will be a sub-account capital reserve account for capital non-recurring expenses purchases. For non recurring expenses. Capital. Capital. Okay. The Town Council will consider the request to transfer and may transfer all, some, or none of the surplus funds into the incentive capital account. In doing so, the Town Council will consider the reason for the surplus with an emphasis on encouraging efficiencies within the department. The Town Council will also consider the status of the town's undesignated surplus fund with consideration to maintaining an adequate fund balance. Other considerations may also be weighed. When the department requests an expenditure to be made from the capital incentive capital account, the request will be brought to the town council for consideration and approval and shall be used only for capital or other non-recurring expenses. And yes, Ms. Francis. Uh, we, we just defined that it should say capital and non-recurring expenses. I believe that was council's definition. Yeah, you, yeah. you asked the question. And? Okay. And. And. Okay. and. Okay. and. Right. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Can I just make a friendly <laughs> amendment for that paragraph two? Sound didn't sound too good. Can we say something like, "Which will be sub accounts within the capital reserve fund, segregated by department"? Right. The second. Yeah. Perfect. Or capital. Yeah. Nope. Don't say anything else. <laughs> that was it. Right. Within. Sub accounts within the capital reserve fund. Segregated, segregated by, by department. department. Just yeah, where are that we? reads better. Second paragraph. Second, second paragraph. paragraph. Second paragraph. Right. Last right. sentence. Which will be sub accounts. Within the capital reserve account. Fund. Capital. Right. So say that again. Which will be sub accounts uh -huh. within the capital reserve fund. Uh -huh. Segregated by department. Wait, let her write it. Capital yep. reserve fund. fund. I can repeat. Segregated by department. Segregated by department. For capital and non recurring expenses. All right. Okay. I would wait for right. the second reading of the entire. No, no. Yes. Come on. Yes. Okay. All right. So, with the friendly amendment, as amended, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. All right. Um, item B We had a presentation at the last town council meeting of the. Uh, from the Lanesville uh, Fire Department regarding the uh, proposed expansion at the uh, fire station. It was proposed to set up a subcommittee. I'm proposing a, um, a three-member subcommittee made up of town council members. I, I, I know I hadn't you know, asked about this, but you know, do we have any volunteers? Mr. Bass, uh, let's see, Mr. Szymanski's volunteer. Anybody else? I mean, if we have extras, we'll kind of address that. Mr. Chamberlain, Mr. Wargo. Anyway, anybody. So we've got four. How about we make it a four-person committee then? Sure. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, so Mr. Bear, yeah. I think if we get more than four, we create a quorum. I think four is our limit. Stick to I. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, mean, I think we could do four. And if there's an issue with the vote, I'll break the tie. I would be more than happy to see my seat to... Yeah. Mr. Bear. There you go. There you're on. You're on. Walter. Walter. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. All right, so we'll make so a motion. Uh, so, motion, please. Uh, motion to create um, town council committee for the purpose of reviewing the proposed <laughs> expansion at the Lanesville Fire Station pursuant to Charter Section 402. And Second. we want to go on to appoint the members to Sure, members, yeah. And um, um, move the appointment of Peter Bass, Frank Wargo, Walter Bear, and Paul. Uh, Tom Esposito? No, Paul, no, no, no. No. Paul, Paul Shemansky oh. to the committee. Okay. Your term? It's usually six months. Uh, I think for it, a term. Oh, is it a year or six months? It goes initially to, it can be for as much as a year and then it be removed as much as six months. Although right. the other committees have done it on Okay. August so, 1st, 2016 through August 1st, 2017. Fair enough. August 1st. August 1st. Are we voting? Alright. No, we haven't voted yet. Oh, yeah, I need a second, actually. Second. second. Okay, I made the motion. Okay. Alright. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, very good, thank you. In item C, our final agenda, we have, um, we previously created some um, subcommittees for, and I apologize, this was, this needs to be reversed. Item I, is supposed to be the position code where um, Ms. Francis, Ms. Lundgren were appointed. Item II is the personnel description where Mr. Chamberlain, Ms. Richardson were appointed. We have two open positions if, um, you know, for housekeeping purposes, if anybody's interested in doing it. Otherwise, I'll task the committee with just working with who's um, been appointed so far. Uh, is there any other additional interest for these two committees? Um, seeing none. Okay, then we'll task it with just the two that are that are on there. Mr. Chamberlain, did you have something to add? I did not. Oh, okay, I don't know if you were volunteering. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mr. Bass. Thank you, Mayor. Before, before we adjourn, Walter, I'm sorry, real quick. Mm -hmm. we'll when, have to act um, on I apologize. Huh? Quick on the you have to act on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't think there's anything to act oh, on okay. because yeah, we're not appointing voting. anybody. It was an open yeah. kind of item. Yeah. Okay. Um, vote on yeah. When I was watching the, the the TV from our last meeting, when we made the when we made the motion um, concerning East Street School, and then doing the appraisal, we're in the process of getting an appraisal. Um, and by way of update, Kevin is talking to appraisers, and he's getting quotes. And hopefully, by the next town council meeting, we'll have an additional update on that. In in the motion, we only made a motion to to. Um, Approve going, amending, suspending the rules, and yeah. suspending the rules of oh. adding. We never made we never, a motion to. We never made the final vote. Oh, oh just we only voted to suspend correct. the rules. We so, never voted on the motion. What does it say in the we, minutes? What is what is? It's been done. So go ahead. Can we reapprove? Yeah. Okay, okay, so we, we can we can vote to suspend the rules again to make that motion. Um, I think we'd have to do it again, and then we would actually make the motion to okay. pass the resolution. Um, you know, the authorization. What motion was to suspend the rules and authorize the mayor to spend up to five thousand dollars for appraisals on the 50 East Street property. That was. Should we tie it all together? But we never. I don't made, think we're allowed we to. We never. You have to make two motions: suspend the rules to right. add it to the agenda, right. and, and then, then you got to vote. Yeah. So why don't we do it? I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules to add an item to the agenda. I'm seconding that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. Now the motion. You make. I'll make the motion to authorize the mayor to go out to bid for our appraisal for the East Street School. I don't know if you want to put a, an amount on there. It gives you flexibility. I know five thousand was authorized. Was authorized. It can be an MIA can be higher than that though. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it is, you know, come back and, and for a special appropriate. Yeah. Um, but I think five thousand is appropriate. Okay. okay. So with that amount, is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion Thank you very much. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you.